Thank you and good afternoon, members, officers, and any members of the public. Did I say good afternoon? Good morning. That, that's a good start. That's a good start. I think it's probably because I arrived early. I'm not used to arriving early. <laughs> Been here a long time. Let's start again. Good morning. Uh, members, officers, and members of the public who are viewing the live streaming of this meeting. So welcome to South Cam's District Council Planning Committee. My name is Councillor Pippa Halings, and I'm the chair of the committee. Um, just very quickly, as you know, everybody who's in the chamber, please note that anything that you have on your desk is visible because the cameras um, can see things on your desk. So just make a note of that. The camera follows the microphone when it's switched on, so even phones or notes that you have can be seen. Um, and any of those who are participating via the live stream, please indicate that you wish to speak via the chat column. So my vice chair will be noting hands raised within the room and the chat column and putting everything in order to make sure that everybody does get that chance to speak. And obviously make sure your device is fully charged. You switch your microphone off unless invited to do otherwise um, and then switch it on and your camera on when we invite you to speak. And please, um, everybody, just speak slowly and clearly um, as that makes it easier for everybody to take part in this hybrid setting. Um, please note that if we do need to vote on any item, we'll do so via the microphones, via the voting system there. And committee members, good, present in the chamber, I'll now introduce each of us to introduce ourselves. So once again, as I said, my name is Councillor Pippa Halings and I'm the Chair of the Planning Committee. My Vice Chair, Councillor Henry Batchelor. Good morning, Chair. Councillor Henry Batchelor, Vice Chairman of the Committee. Thank you very much. Councillor Martin Kahn. Good morning, Ma uh, Councillor Martin Kahn, Member for Histon, Impington and Orchard Park. Thank you, Councillor Peter Fain. Peter Fain, Shelford Ward. Good, thank you. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes, Councillor Jeff Harvey, Borsham Ward. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Toomey Hawkins, District Councillor for Caldicott Ward. Thank you. Councillor Judith Griffith. Good morning. I'm Councillor Judith Griffith, representing Milton and Waterreach Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Good morning, Madam Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Deborah Roberts, District Councillor for Foxton Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Heather Williams. Good morning, Chair. I'm Heather Williams, and I represent the Northerns Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Good morning, Chair. Thank you very much. I'm Richard Williams. I represent the Wickersford Ward. Thank you. And Councillor Eileen Wilson, who is not here with us. We'll have apologies. Um, and do we have any other members present? Don't think so virtually. No, they may come if they're speaking to an item. So I can confirm that the meeting is for it. We also have two officers in the chamber. Um, Chris Carter, who is our delivery manager. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. Thank you very much. And Richard Pitt, our legal advisor for today. Thank you, Chair. Morning, members. Good. Welcome to you. Welcome to our council meeting. And also, um, Ian Senior, are you with us? Hello, Chair. Hello, everyone. I'm here. Thank you very much. And Ian, obviously, he's been much. taking the, the minutes. And Ian, is this your last meeting with us? Uh, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Um, another couple of months yet. Oh, OK. Good. Thank you with us. Thank Should you very be. much. Okay. OK. Thank you. Um, if anybody members want to leave the meeting or need to leave the meeting, would they please make that fact known to me so that we can be recorded in the meetings by Ian. And given that we're in a room with very poor ventilation, as normal, we'll be taking a break. Um, I suggest that that break is um, for 15 minutes approximately every hour. I would suggest the first one's around 11.15. Um, if that's okay, Councillor Heather Williams. Sorry, Chair, there's a problem with the modern gov, which means we can't get onto online things. It also means we can't access the local plan. Is it possible to have hard copies available for us? Because I do normally look at it because we can't get onto the electronic version. I think that's the question. Yeah, we'll be able to do that. Thank you. And um, um, maybe for that, we could have one in the room. I think 
particular occasions. It, do, if we sort of do that break for 15 minutes around about every hour, but not on the hour, depending where we are on the agenda item, is that okay? So we'll just sort of take it in terms of common sense. And then in terms of when we're getting closer to um, the lunch break, which I think would be around one o'clock, depending on where we are, do you mind if I then put it to you, if we've only got one item, whether or not we, we do it or we have the break? But otherwise, we'll just take a nose break, if that's okay. Yeah? Good. So um, agenda item two, apologies, please, Ian. Hello. Um, apologies just from Councillor Wilson, uh, and I'm not aware of any substitutes, I'm afraid. No, that was a, a late one and within the COVID. Indeed. Yes, she, COVID. she was looking for a sub, I think, but uh, couldn't find one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. In COVID times, these are, these are difficult when you get the late alerts and things. Thank you very much. In terms of agenda item three, declarations of interest, do I have any declarations of interest? Yeah, three so far, Chair Councillors Williams, Roberts, and Griffith. Thank you, in that order. Thank you, Chairman. Um, agenda item seven is um, in relation to an application for, from Councillor Cone. Um, given the closeness of which we work and the fact we're friends, I won't take part in that debate. Um, I will remain in the chamber, but I won't take any part at all. Um, and then I'm the local member for something that's been included in the enforcement report. Thank you yeah. very much. Okay. Councillor Roberts. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, item six, uh, declaration of non-pecuniary interest, as I am a member of Falmere Parish Council who have um, put their views in, um, just to state that the, the written work from the Parish Council, I, I took no part in actually um, drafting that. Um, I was there when they were dis discussing it, but it was done by the chairman of the parish council and the planning committee chairman. I, I took no part in that. Um, and at item nine, which is the um, Cottenham item, I won't take any part and I won't vote in it. I'll probably sit and listen, but I, I won't take any part because it's a travellers issue. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Um, Councillors Griffith and Richard Williams. Um, I'm discussing non-pecuniary interest in agenda item five, I'm a local member. I did meet with the applicant about three years ago with an officer present when the application was in a different iteration. That application was withdrawn, so I come to this matter afresh. Thank you very much. Councillor? Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I should make the same declaration in relation to item seven, just because Councillor Cohn has objected to leave of my group. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, is that just in terms of those who are on Teams? Does somebody have their video still on? Ian, thank you. You can just turn your video off. Thank you very much. Um, and members, minutes. We have a bit of a marathon of, of minutes, and I think this is um, in part as Ian Senior is preparing to clear his desk and make sure that we've got all of the, the backlog through, so we have three sets of minutes um, in front of us. So um, we'll move quickly through those. So first of all, we have the minutes on page one, which are from Friday 19th of February. Do we have any comments on the meeting on those minutes, please, members? One from Councillor Ripeth and Fane, Chair. Um, just to say that, I'll add Fane because I wasn't present. Thank you. Councillor Fane? Can, can we hear you, Councillor Thank you. The problem with the um, second paragraph on page three is that when we come back to this uh, particular item again, um, as inevitably we will, it might be taken as an indication that uh, the, it refers to C2C, 
which is a particular scheme for meeting the condition 13 on page 8. There may be other ways of meeting that. And uh, if these minutes were to be taken literally, it might be taken as an indication that should that scheme not go through, then the condition could not be met in other ways. I think the, the word the plus way may be uh, perhaps misleading there. So we would want to change if by then the, uh, the busway, that's the bit. The busway is not operational. Thank you. Thank you. And noted. Um, Councillor Griffith, you had one. Um, I would also abstain from this if I wasn't um, present. But I do like on page one that um, it seems that I sent apologies for apologies, Ian Senior. So um, but perhaps we just need to remove one of the apologies. That's good. So can we take the minutes of the 19th of February by affirmation with those changes? Great, thank you very much. So on page 11, which is the second set of minutes, this is for the minutes for the meeting of Wednesday, 26th of May. Do we have any comments on those? Councillor Ripper? Yes, on the bottom of page 12, um, I think it's a typo where a comment um, spoke as local member and articulated that her main concerns with the application could be addressed at the reserve matter stage. That's fine. She added that there was no need to attribute significant weight to the inspector's decision, whereas actually I said the opposite, that we did need to attribute weight. So if that could just be altered, please. That's significant. So Ian, if you could take that note of that. No one else? Um, I have one which is on page 13 and the bottom which is during the ensuing debate, members referred to the following. Um, what's missing is the um, significant open space contributions that were being made, which was also a key swaying part in the argument. So if we could include that within the bullet points, please. Also on page 15, item 10, um, I think there's a sentence missing. So, Ian, is that okay in terms of those um, comments? Hello, Ian. Hello, Ian. Chair, Chair, sorry. I'm, I'm on two different desks at the moment, so it took me, took me time to get to my computer. That, that is absolutely fine. I've got all, the, all that down. Thank you very much. Members, can we take that by affirmation then to approve the minutes of um, Wednesday 26th of May? Thank you very much. And on page 17 of our agenda pack, the minutes for Wednesday 9th of June. Do we have any comments on those minutes? Councillor Harvey. Yeah, Councillor Harvey. Yes, thank you, Chair. No, just to say uh, on um, page 19, um, uh, just... Um, my comment, um, I, I think the causation of that is kind of the obverse from what I meant. Um, my concern was that um, the design of the hotel should um, protect future residents from the fact that the um, airport is a very noisy environment rather than the other way around. Do you understand that comment, Ian? You've got that noted. Thank you, Chris. Um, any other comments on the minutes? Thank you, Chair. Just a small one on page 19 at the bottom. It's just a typo. It says that we voted in favore, which I think is Italian. Would you Probably like to sing it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good. Um, and so can we take those final set of minutes um, by affirmation? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So now we move um, to the substantive part of the agenda, agenda item five on page 23 of our agenda packs. Um, this is application number 20 slash 05253 slash full application in Water Beach. And the proposal is a hybrid application for the expansion of existing business park to create a sustainable campus comprising the full application for the erection of two office class E buildings, the outline application um, for the erection of additional office floor space together with the landscaping 
subs, earthworks, renewable energy generation, storage, new pedestrian and cycle routes, cycle and parking facilities, and associated works. This is in the Cambridge Innovation Park, Demi End Road and Water Beach, Cambridge. The applicants are Cambridge Innovation Parks. The officer recommendation is delegated approval. And the key material considerations that we would bring to debate members here are the principle of development, access, highway safety and parking provision, character and visual amenity, residential amenity, biodiversity, trees and landscaping, flood risk and damp drainage, renewables and climate change, the developer contributions and other matters. It's not um, a departure. The presenting officer is Alice Young. Alice, are you with us? And this is brought to committee because the officer recommendation conflicts with the comments and recommendations of Water Beach Parish Council. That's why it's with us today. Hello, Alice. How are you? Um, could you give us any updates and a summary of the application, please? Of course. So um, there has been an update. Um, our sustainable drainage officer has provided uh, a consultation response and has no objections um, in line with the LLFA and the ITB responses. Thank you. That's important. That, that was one of the objections to remain in place. Thank you. Um, can you give us a summary now of the application itself, Alice? Bear with me whilst I um, share my screen. <coughs> Chairman, if I may, just before we start, before um, the officer starts a presentation, we, we had a late input email from Water Beach Parish Council, and um, I, I'm not sure is if the fact is that they wanted to join us today but haven't been able to. Can we just have clarification? No, um, many we, thanks. We received that and it has been resolved and as I understand we do have Councillor Jane Williams of Woodford Parish Council um, attending and will be able to make her comments virtually. Thank you, Alice. Brilliant, thank you. The proposal is for a hybrid application for the expansion of the existing business park to create a sustainable campus comprising a full application for two office buildings and associated landscaping and an outline application for all matters reserved except for access and scale for additional office space together with landscaping, suds and associated works at Cambridge Innovation Park, North Denny End Road. The site is located on the north side of Denny End Road, on the edge of the Water Beach Village and outside of the development framework. Water Beach New Town site borders the application site to the north and east. The land directly surrounding the application site is allocated as a country park, with the closest residential dwellings located approximately 55 metres to the north of the site. The Army Cadet Training Centre is sited to the west of the site. The site is an existing established business park comprising um, Sterling House, a 3.5 storey ex-MOD building sited centrally within the site, and Blenheim House, a 2.5 storey building which was built in 2007 and is located along the eastern boundary. Both of these buildings will be retained as part of the proposal. The site also contains existing suds features, a mature tree belt along the southern boundary and mature trees um, to the northwestern corner and landscaping throughout the site. Uh, this drone shot gives a good illustration of the existing site. Um, as you'll see, um, Sterling House is to the left and Burnham House is to the right. Um, surrounded by um, ground level car parking and um, landscaping. The proposal comprises two applications, a full application um, for two office buildings referred to as building three and building four, totaling um, 4,588 square metres of office space and associated landscaping. This full application is split into two phases, phase 1A which is building three and phase 1B which is building four. The outline application refers to the further phase of development comprising further office space, landscaping and supporting facilities for a sustainable campus. Here all matters are reserved except for access and scale. Please do ask any 
points of clarification if these phases are not clear at the end of the presentation. Uh, this is the illustrative master plan. Um, as you'll see, Sterling House and Blenheim House are retained. Um, building three and building four, um, phase one A and phase one B um, in the full application are um, cited to the north east of the site. And then um, the surrounding buildings and landscaping um, are within the outline consent. Um, this illustrates the um, full planning permission aspect of the hybrid scheme. Um, these drawings show phase 1A and phase 1B. You'll note that phase 1B includes further landscaped areas and a temporary car park located, located to the west of building 4 behind Sterling House. This is phase 1A, so building 3. Uh, this is the site plan and the ground floor plan. My, my apologies, that's the ground floor plan and the first floor plan. Uh, this is the uh, south elevation and the east elevation, building three, phase 1A, which shows building three's relationship with the existing building, Blenheim, Blenheim, Blenheim House, um, which is on, along the eastern boundary. Um, this is the north elevation and the western elevation of building three. And then this is phase 1B, so we're still within the full application. So this is building four. Um, phase 1B erects building four and associated landscaping, including swells and contemporary car park. So this is a site plan. This is the ground floor plan. First floor plan with potential future link bridge to building three. Second floor plan. and roof plan, which includes PV panels. This is the uh, southeastern elevation, so this is the front elevation of building four. It's the side elevation, southwest, so this is adjacent to Sterling House. Uh, the northwestern elevation, so this is the rear. And the other side elevation, the northeastern elevation. Um, I've put in some perspective views um, so you can see the buildings within the existing um, site. Um, so Sterling House is, is um, to, the, to the left, and building four and building three are labelled on, on the plans. These are all perspective views. <clears throat> and these are CGIs to kind of give you a, a more of a picture of the elevation or treatment of the buildings. So we're now on to the outline um, element of the planning permission of the hybrid scheme. Um, the outline element is for all matters um, reserved except for access and scale for the erection of further office space in building five, in the form of building five, a car parking deck, landscaping and supporting facilities. This is an illustrative site plan um, demonstrating that the site can accommodate the proposed floor space whilst remaining a landscape led design. I've just popped um, the key vision for the site um, on the left hand side. So this includes the central um, landscape green space and cafe facilities um, to the southeast of Sterling House, um, the shared pedestrian and cycle route through the on the diagonal and um, through the site, and the car parking deck to the northwest of the site of Sterling House, um, the energy building um, which is currently um, located the north of building five, outdoor working spaces which are weaved throughout the scheme and solar cycle parking and showering facilities. Um, again this is um, illustrative um, with all matters reserved except for access and scale but it does demonstrate um, what could be done with the site. 
Uh, this is the parameter plan, um, which details the scale of the, of the site, showing that building five would be approximately three storeys and the depth car park um, would be 2.5 storeys, all below the 3.5 storey height of Sterling House, which is the, um, what's considered the main focal point of, of the site. Here again is the illustrative master plan, um, which incorporates several features which I've mentioned in the vision section, um, which would um, provide wider public benefits such as the energy centre, the central green space with cafe facilities and the shared cycle and pedestrian route through the sites um, linking to the strategic cycling infrastructure proposed to the north um, and Water Beach New Town to the north. Um, the bridge links over the proposed swales assist um, in placemaking and connect to the characteristics of, of Cambridge and, and Fenland um, to ensure these are provided um, in the reserve matters application a condition um, is proposed to secure these um, for delivery. And this is the 3D model to give you a bit more of a, an understanding of the site um, in 3D. So uh, Blenheim House is um, labelled as one, um, Selling House is, is two, and then uh, Building Three is three, and so on. So um, we're on the principal development now. Um, whilst the site falls outside of the development framework boundary, um, Policy S7 states that development of this nature would be acceptable if supported by other policies in the local plan. Um, policy E9, E13 and E16 support development of high tech clusters, development on the edge of villages and expansion of existing um, employment provided suitability can be demonstrated. The proposal is strategically located along the Cambridge Science Park, Cambridge Research Park corridor and adjacent to Water Beach Newtown enhancing the existing Cambridge cluster whilst meeting future demand of Water Beach Newtown. Um, I think this is particularly illustrated by um, the diagram on the screen. Um, so the site is circled in red and the um, research parks and um, Newtown are circled in, in blue. Moreover, the site is um, an established business park with demand for office space demonstrated by the business case and poses the most suitable location for this type of development in the area. It is also worth noting that the draft from the Beach Neighbourhood Plan supports new employment uses on this site. The site is well connected, accessible via regular rail and bus services within walking and cycling distance from the site and will be connected to strategic improvements to the surrounding cycling infrastructure, which is planned to the north of the site. This accessibility will only increase alongside the strategic transport improvements along the ATEM. The proposal encourages a modal shift for employees by enhancing and promoting active travel, linking, the, linking to the strategic transport network and Water Beach Newtown alongside incentivising use of rail and bus services through shuttle buses and financial contributions. While the A10 is currently at capacity in certain, in, in certain locations, by virtue of the proposed modal shift, the um, County Council Highway Major Development Team advised that the net vehicular trips to the site would not increase if the travel plan is implemented effectively. Therefore, the proposal would not pose significant additional stress on the existing transport network. Drainage. Initially, the Internal Drainage Board and Lead Local Flood Authority and the Drainage Officer objected to the application due to proposed discharge rates. However, these have been resolved and all three consultees are now supportive of the application um, subject to conditions which are um, recommended um, and included in the officer recommendation. The proposal aims to be an example of sustainability by including various um, measures, um, including sustainable construction methods and design practices, renewable energy and resource efficiency, promoting sustainable transport and providing sociable workspaces which are flexible to the needs of the occupiers and facilities to enable benefits for an integration with the wider locality. 
the proposal is an innovative forward thinking development supporting the transition to a zero carbon economy, which exceeds the sustainability standards set out in policy CC1, CC3 and CC4. <coughs> Sorry. Alongside providing contributions to transport improvements and public benefit through job creation, provision of green space and connections to Water Beach Newtown. Um, some of the sustainability credentials are highlighted on the screen um, before you. And this is the uh, 3D model of the illustrative master plan, just at a different angle to um, illustrate the, the landscape on site and, and the proposed buildings. And this is the other angle, um, which shows um, the swales and, and the bridges throughout the site alongside the cycle um, and pedestrian route. So in conclusion, officer's recommendation is one of approval um, of the innovative and sustainably designed hybrid application subject to conditions and, and section 106. Officers request delegated authority for the wording and form of the conditions and the completion of the section 106 agreement in accordance with the heads of terms set out in paragraph 129 of the committee report. I just listed some of the headline conditions um, on this on this um, slide and then the heads of terms are, are there on, on this slide. So thank you. Thank you very much for that excellent summary there, Alex. Uh, Alice, and um, we'll take this one. I see that Councillor Roberts has a, a question, but we will take the main bulk of questions when we get into the main debate as well. Um, but we take that question if that's okay, Councillor Roberts. Um, well, if you if you could wait, I, I prefer it to go because I think it helps. The, I think what we found is it helps the flow of the debate when we bring it into the debate. We still maintain the questions to any of the public speakers to allow for clarification. Is that okay as well for everybody? Thank you. Um, so we will now move to the public speakers. Thank you very much, Alice. Stay with us for the debate. Um, public speakers for Water Beach. And we do have with us, I think it's Professor John French on behalf of the applicant, which is Cambridge Innovation Parks. Do we have you with us? Uh, yes, good morning, I'm here. Thank you, and I understand that you're together with Matthew Dugdale, who's the planning agent. In case there are any clarification questions, he could help with those. That's correct. Thank you very much. And uh, you know the procedure, you have three minutes, and um, I have Chris Carter by my side who will help me with the timing for that. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Are you happy for me to start now? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. So, thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. Uh, my name is Professor John French. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Cambridge Innovation Parks Limited, who are the applicant. Uh, CIPL are local investors, developers, and operators of business parks. Cambridge Innovation Park North is one of three sites in the Cambridge area that CIPL owns. Uh, CIPL has owned this campus at Denny End Road since 2012, and today the site is a thriving business park, uh, comprising two occupied office buildings and an on-site cafe and gym, which are open to the local community. It is home to 40 uh, businesses within the creative, knowledge and high technology sectors. And there is a significant demand and tenant interest for further office floor space in this location. Proposals before you seek to uh, seek hybrid planning permission to deliver the expansion and transformation of the existing site into a sustainable innovation campus. Uh, the illustrative master plan sets out a phased approach to development, which will result in a high quality and sustainable scheme that raises the bar for development in Water Beach as a gateway location. The scheme is underpinned by a comprehensive green travel plan, which promotes and facilitates a modal shift towards green and active travel. The proposal, um, we've sought to exceed sustainability standards, and there is a package of contributions towards transport improvements to help facilitate modal shift, including contributions to the Greenways Initiative, street lighting and bus shelters, on Denny End Road and a shuttle bus service between the site and Water Beach Station. The scheme will also develop, deliver multiple um, benefits, including job creation, we estimate 725 new jobs, support the long-term viability of the existing cafe and gym facilities, 
an extensive landscaping scheme across the site that achieves biodiversity net gain uh, and new pedestrian and cycle links to connect the site to its existing surroundings of Water Beach Newtown. From the outset, we entered into a PPA with the district and county officers who have worked tirelessly in a proactive and positive fashion to ensure that all potential technical constraints were identified um, and addressed early on. We have also engaged with the neighbouring residents and businesses, Urban and Civic, and Water Beach Parish Council. As confirmed by the planning officer's report, the proposed development is supported by the local and national planning policy. Furthermore, the emerging Water Beach neighbourhood plan supports new employment uses at Cambridge Innovation Park North in principle. And as demonstrated in your officer's report, we accord with this policy and, over, and have overcome their objections. We fully support your officer recommendation to approve this application. No objections have been received from statutory consultees, and there are no technical reasons as to why the development should not be approved. I would sincerely like to thank uh, you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions and provide any clarifications where necessary. In addition, uh, my planning agent, uh, Matt Matthew Dugdale, is available here to answer any more technical questions um, should you have them for this scheme. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much and for keeping to time as well. So um, we'll see if there are any questions. One so far, Chair, uh, from Councillor Ripper, but then also Councillors Hawkins and Edward. Thank you. Councillor Ripper. Good morning and thank you for that explanation. Can I ask you, how do you um, predict or project the working patterns of those using the site kind of currently and also how they might evolve? Um, well, to give you an overview, we are encouraging through the use of a community app um, a transformation strategy with the use of, um, for the use of businesses on the site so that we encourage them to follow the green travel plan that we set out. So we do see, uh, we, we see this central to the whole scheme is the modal shift in the approach uh, that we're adopting for the campus. So there will be hybrid working and we do expect people to be working outside and making use of the organized landscape facilities that we set out as well. So we have tried to adopt a progressive approach to the development of the site and the way in which people will use it. Um, but Matt may want to add some further comments to that. Thank you, Matt. And if you would sort of address the question of how you're doing the calculations of that, I think the question was in there about how you're addressing the sort of quantification or predictions of those. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, as, as Professor John French has said, um, there, is, there, ha there is going to be an expectation of a more hybrid working model in the future, but equally, Businesses need to ensure that uh, the facilities are there on site to enable uh, working to, to workers to come back to the office and the workspaces are, are secure and flexible and can be adapted in the future. Now, CIPL has, has been monitoring um, the, the level of attendance on site throughout the pandemic and has obviously been speaking with its many tenants and businesses that, that operate there. And there is certainly demand uh, for many of those businesses to, to return to the work workplace. And indeed, um, conversations from prospective tenants who were interested in the new floor space that's sought by this application, <clears throat> excuse me, have equally shown um, a desire to come back to the workplace. Now that, that will be monitored um, throughout the future as, as the phases of development come online here uh, in, on, on the site. Thank you. Councillor Ripper, did you want to? Yes, a follow up, if I may. Um, so from what you're saying, you were giving me the impression that it won't be a nine to five necessarily working pattern. It might be part time, might come in for a few hours. And the expectation is to use an app and to try and plan that. But also, will that mean the shuttle bus will be working throughout the day as a frequency? People are getting the train to the railway station. Yes, I mean, that, that's right. There is a comprehensive green travel plan which sets out a range of measures and it's, it's done under the plan monitor manage approach um, with the county council. 
so there are measures in place that are set out through the the, the travel plan which would be conditioned and they'll also be uh, secured by section 106 agreement and that that will be monitored and managed in collaboration with the county council to ensure that those services are, are right and fit fit for purpose and will that ensure that the modal shift sought by this application can be delivered. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. <clears throat> My question hopefully is a simple one. Um, I note from um, the professor's contribution that he said currently there is a cafe on the site that is open to the public. Um, in the light of the asks from the parish council, are they able to tell me which of the facilities in the new campus will be available still to the community? Thank you. Thank you. Who'd answer that one? Um, I'm happy to go first. Our intention is to continue our open access policy um, for the community, for the facilities on this campus. That is core to the ethos of the development that we have proposed here. So the answer is to all, all of the facilities would be open yeah. access. Yeah. Councillor Hawkins, thank you. And Councillor Heatherly. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, in relation to the comments from the Parish Council, there's concern around the attenuation ponds and fencing. Is that something that you would be agreeable to um, if it was conditioned that there must be fencing around the ponds? Thank you. I'm going to pass that question to Matt Dovedale to answer that point. Thank you, Councillor. It's, it's, it's a suggestion, I think, which is something that can be um, looked at through a planning condition. Certainly, there's an intention to require a full landscaping scheme uh, to be submitted um, before those landscaping works are undertaken. And the works will be undertaken in phases as well. So I think that is something that, that can be looked at with, with officers as part of that consideration. Yeah. And Councillor Harvey, Chair. Councillor Harvey. And yes, thank you, Chair. Um, right, I wondered if you could um, explain a bit more about how the microgrid and the energy centre and the PVs um, work together um, and also talk a bit more about what's envisaged for the heat pump technology. Is it going to be air source or ground source? And then also perhaps picking up on page 45, um, paragraph 124, it seems that um, there's, there's um, possibly the potential for further ambition with um, water management and I wondered uh, if there are any ideas for how we could um, increase the ambition level there. Um, would I start on that, um, Councillor Harvey? Um, the building designs, if you drill into them, are based on mechanical ventilation and heat recovery systems and the use of air source heat pumps. The buildings are designed to what we would call uh, a passive design principle. Um, so we are seeking to get the lowest possible energy consumption that we can, although we haven't intended to go with passive house certification because of the cost associated with that. But we are looking at passive design in principle. So the first element of the net zero strategy is to get demand of the energy down to the lowest possible level and for users of the buildings and the site to understand the importance of that. Um, second point then is clearly we need to be looking at not just operational energy but embodied energy and embodied carbon and so the design concept that's been used for these facilities is locally sourced materials, timber, sawn timber frame construction of the buildings for and by to maximise um, carbon storage in buildings and also to maximise building life so that we can um, minimise future emissions um, from the uh, removal of buildings. So this is an area that I specialise in. Um, so we've been keen to get this concept integrated but at a campus level rather than just in a simply an individual building level. Um, we're simultaneously looking at energy reduction strategies on the other buildings. So we have an integrated plan that we are working through. And key to this will be how we integrate energy supply and energy cons consumption across the whole site. 
Um, I wouldn't say we are fully there yet on that, but we do see the potential to generate power from the solar panels and to store it locally with battery storage. Associated with the new multi-storey car park in phase three as being a way to manage a local uh, energy grid and have an integrated campus-wide strategy. So I think it's what I would describe as um, aspirational work in progress. Um, but we would like to see this development as setting the standard and asking difficult questions that need to be answered in order to help the wider district achieve zero carbon and net zero carbon across business parks, because there currently is no established typology um, for this kind of integrated approach. I think I've answered all your questions. I think on water, our approach is an innovative substrate drainage scheme. Uh, it's, it's driven by water conservation uh, and water um, for waste minimization, um, because as you know, um, managing water is one of the UN sustainable development goals. So we've integrated that into our sustainability plan. Uh, and of course, where possible, um, we will manage peaks and troughs of um, surface water through the use of the swales that we've expanded on the site. So again, wherever possible, local management um, kicking in to um, make best use of resources. Um, we think the swales is also a very nice natural asset um, for, the, for the community of users uh, in, the, in the business eco-village, if you like, um, because it also provides a natural asset, some natural capital, some biodiversity. Um, and of course, you'll be aware that we've set a net biodiversity net gain target of 13%, um, which is quite ambitious, but I think it's entirely appropriate for a site of this kind. Um, Matt, does, Matt, do you want to add anything to that? Thank you, John. I think you've eloquently covered all the, all the points there. Thank you very much. And we have Councillor Khan here. Um, just a brief thing. I've, um, you talked about the, uh, the, the, the work plans and, uh, and timing. Um, I just wonder whether you'd looked at the, the probable destinations of people working on, on site. Will, will people mainly be coming out of Cambridge? Will you, uh, do you foresee the majority coming from the adjoining new town when it's built? Uh, how, how do you see the, uh, um, the, 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 uh, the directions of flow? Uh, um, will it be mainly county current to the main uh, flows towards Cambridge, or will it be? Uh, uh, how does it fit in? Um, well, it's probably going to provide employment for significant numbers of um, people on the Water Beach Newtown, uh, and we have been collaborating very closely with Urban and Civic on this. Um, wherever possible, we would we would seek to encourage local um, employment, um, linked to local communities, and to minimise impact on the. Um, the travel networks that has been core to this philosophy there will of course be some businesses with staff that travel further but they will be asked to work within our green travel plan that we've established um, so i think it's a combination of things um, but clearly with an opportunity associated with the new town to provide employment right on the doorstep um, this scheme has also opened up permeability to the new town um, with access routes on the north and the west corners of the site and the east corner of the site um, so really, I think this, I would like to think this is an example of some thought through um, coordination around um, integrated planning um, with the new town. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, um, both of you, for those um, responses. And we now go to the comments um, from Councillor Jane Williams. Are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Hello, we can hear you, Councillor Williams, but yes. not, not necessarily see you just yet. No, I'm just putting the video on. Here we are, should be arriving here somewhere. Yeah, it doesn't seem to, it's cleared that um, you can see me, but I can't see you. Oh, wonderful, we can see you now. Can you see us and hear us? We can see you, Pippa. Thank you. And we can hear you perfectly as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so just to um, obviously establish as normal that you have the authority of the parish council to be addressing us today. That's correct. Good. Thank you very much. Um, and apologies if there were any issues about you having the confirmation and the link and things like that. No worries. I'm happy that um, I'm able to speak on behalf of the parish and also our residents, really. That's the main thing. Yeah. Thank you very much. And so you know the, the drill that you have three minutes and Chris Carter will be helping um, to monitor that time. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Water Beach Parish Council notes that South Cam's officers have agreed a lump sum payment of £22,000 as sufficient for WPC to maintain the bus stops for the development in perpetuity. WPC notes that a contribution of £10,000 is sought for street lighting for Denny End Road and is being allocated to the future phase S106 agreement. It is clear no money has been allocated for such improvements in phase one. WPC specifically requested that a lit footway be provided to ensure the safety of pedestrians and cyclists from the beginning of this application, if this application is granted approval. WPC is unclear when councillors were formally approached to be party to the S106 agreements, as there appears to have been no formal invitation for these and other S106 agreements for the development. WPC, when requesting conditions, page 27, para 22 of the agenda pack, asked that the drainage ditch and the bus stops were the responsibility of the innovation park. There is no provision for a pedestrian footway along Denny End Road from the development to the 8 End Junction and south of the development on the western side towards the village as requested by WPC. This entrance is subject to speeding vehicles accessing and exiting the industrial estates and Water Beach Village. It is especially dark and dangerous for pedestrians, particularly in the winter months. It is further exacerbated by Urban and Civic's original proposals for a temporary access for construction traffic accessing the site via Denny End Road to become permanent. Originally, this was a temporary um, application until the northern access from the EATM was constructed. This will further increase traffic numbers and risks to pedestrians and cyclists. WPC notes that by way of S106, Phase one will give £70,000 to the Water Beach to Cambridge Greenway and a future phase will give a further £54,000. WPC understands that this is a Greater Cambridge Partnership Initiative funded by the Cambridge City Deal um, but not developed contributions. This is going to take me a few seconds over but I have still since find out from GCP that it is developer contributions as long as they can get them. So just going back to my... Um, well, I've nearly finished. WPC considers the proposed package for funding for this development does not serve the interests of Water Beach residents. And WP's request for S106 contributions to the village sadly appear to have fallen on deaf ears in favour of the Greenway. And to finish, WPC would like to add a note of caution regarding the provision of potable water, electricity, sewage and broadband for the parish. After years of speculative development, WPC is concerned that due to information received, many required essential services are now at capacity. Although utility providers have a legal obligation to provide their services, does SCD have any checks in place to ensure um, that supply and demand is met? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we'll see if there are any questions for you. We have two so far, Chair Councillors Hawkins and Heather Williams. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Mrs. Williams, for your um, presentation on behalf of your parish. Um, I note your concern about the monies allocated, uh, especially for the bus, the bus stops, an example. From the way you've said it, it seems as if you are not happy or you don't think that that is sufficient to be able to maintain those bus stops. Uh, that's my first question. Um, the second one is regarding your request for contributions to various amenities um, in the village, which you say seem to have fallen on deaf ears. Um, however, in paragraph 128 uh, of the report, it does say that it has been considered, so it's not fallen on deaf ears. However, those requests do not seem to be necessary to grant the planning permission um, for the movement <coughs> stated in that paragraph. So is that not a uh, sufficient answer for you regarding those asks? Well, I am speaking on behalf of a parish council. Um, it's the, the old chestnut, really. Mm. It is actually being party to what is being agreed for our residents. We have been elected to represent our people. And if we were involved, um, perhaps in these, and we have requested this before to be um, 
party to S106. This could have all been ironed out rather than time after time having to come back. Um, yes, um, the, the bus stops and particularly the drainage um, and, a, and a footpath is really the main ones that are for the safety of our residents and for the increased traffic that this is going to pose. Um, and also an accumulation of the Water Beach New Town. So I think I would go back and say, please, could we as a parish council speak with officers and the developers just to um, ensure that we're all speaking from the same on the same page and that we don't have to continually, almost as though we're being antagonistic, come back to ask these questions. Um, you as our representatives and we as our representatives of the parish. Thanks. As you know, we are suffering huge, huge growth. We've had, we had, I think it was nearly 500 houses spec into development and you can't keep adding the straw to the camel's back. So that's what I would like to say, Councillor Toomey. Thank you for your questions. No, it's not okay. Thank you. And I think it's worth noting that there's a request which we need to consider for delegated authority to investigate with the county council the appropriateness of securing the pathway that has been Where's requested. That uh, it's on page 47, just below the, at the top, just below mm -hmm. the table. So if, if I understand, and we'll take this into the debate and, and perhaps for a proposal that you've been making there for um, <laughs> Councillor Hawkins, is on page 47, underneath um, what are the heads of terms, yeah. but within that greenway, there's more specificity to explicitly talk with County Council and the Parish Council to about get that. the specificity about the pathway improvements Correct. around that. Okay. Other questions? Thank you. Yep, we have a question from Councillor Heather Williams. Chairman, uh, not a question, but um, the Greater Kenneth Partnership got mentioned, so I just need to declare that I'm a member of the Greater Cambridge Partnership Assembly. That's fine. Thank you. No more. Thank you very much for your time again, and um, I hope you'll join us in the hearing in the debate and see what happens with that um, proposal that comes through as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Halings. Thank you to um, the committee as well. Thank you. Um, good, and we now move to any of the local members. I understand that Councillor Paul Bearpark, as local ward member, can't be present, but has sent something through, and Chris Hoff will read that. Thank you, Jane. Yes, these are the comments of Councillor Paul Bearpark. Um, he states the following. I have the following concerns regarding application 20052534. The short stretch of road for accessing the site has several entrances to industrial estates and the entrance for construction traffic to Waterbeach Newtown. This stretch of road is quite hazardous for non-motorised users. Between the A10 and the Innovation Park, there is no footpath on either side of the road, so the only access for pedestrians is to walk in the road itself. This is not safe. Facilities such as the coffee shop and gym are becoming well used by village residents. Therefore, the access from the village to the site needs to be improved by completing the footpath west of the site, north of Denny End Road. This is a missed opportunity to significantly improve this section of road for pedestrians and cyclists. Not making these improvements is inconsistent with the aspiration for mode shift. With construction traffic entering both this site and the Water Beach Newtown site, there needs to be proper consideration of safety for pedestrians and cyclists entering the existing site from the east and the west. The Cambridgeshire County Council Highways Department stated that they had no objection subject to a Section 106 agreement securing improvements to the entrance of the site to encourage sustainable transport prior to the occupation of Building 5 and completion of the car park deck. This is very vague. Does it mean that there will be a continuous footpath from the A10 on the north side of Denny End Road to the existing footpath to the west of the site? Will this be sufficiently wide to be a shared use path? My recommendation is that the Section 106 agreement incorporates provision for dedicated non-motorised user paths to the site from both the east and the west to the north of Denny End Road. Given that the bus stop will primarily be used by those working or visiting the site, the bus stop maintenance should be the responsibility of the Innovation Park, not the Parish Council. Parish residents will not use these bus stops. Does the applicant have a proposal for the frequency of the shuttle bus to the station? A poorly timed and infrequent service would have negligible impact on modal shift. Finally, the design and access statement provides no details of the design of on-site provision for non-motorised users, so it is not possible to comment on the on-site provision. That's the end of his comments. 
Thank you very much. Um, the other local ward member is Councillor Julie Smith. Would you like to speak now or yeah. now? Yes, Councillor Smith. Yes. Okay, looking at this um, application in its entirety, first of all, the first thing I'd like to point out in my belief is that the Brienne standards met are either excellent or exceptional in the first two buildings. And I think that's a very important thing to take on board and the whole attitude towards the build um, can, is commendable on that part. I do acknowledge, however, that some of those sustainable transport options that have missed an opportunity with the footpath. However, um, yes, can we please look at page 47, that paragraph underneath the table about securing that pathway, although that's later on in the um, developing, development, should it be um, approved. And the shuttle bus frequency, that's something else which really needs to be established that it does serve um, those working there. And I would argue that maybe some villagers would use it because the cafe, the gym is quite popular. And indeed, if you're if you've got children going to classes there, you might want to put them all on a bus. So that, I think, could be um, expanded, and I just would like to know how that's going to work, if, it, if that's possible. Um, I was impressed by the idea of an app to try and to use to cover plan and to get businesses really focusing on the patterns of work. Um, and that's really all I have to say at the moment. And obviously, I think lots of interesting things will come out within the debate. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for any of the local members, or we'll take those in the debate? Yep, go into the debate. Good. Thank you very much. Um, and as we open the debate, I wonder whether we it would be useful if um, the case officer, if we could have... Did one of the diagrams show us this path, the sort of the access, the Denny Road access, which is the focus of parish council and local ward member comments? That would be helpful to the debate. I think um, that would be good. Open member. Uh, Councillor Roberts indicated at the very beginning she'd like to speak. And the clarification question. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, I did say at the start that I would like. Um, to put a question to the officer who is dealing with it. So that's what this is about before um, I go into um, the general debate. Um, it's an interesting proposal. I think it's got a lot of good things in it, um, but it's got, um, I'm a little, I want to know a little bit more about uh, the fact on policy, because uh, it is, and it's something that hasn't been touched on, it is outside the village envelope, and I think that at page 35 at 71 of the policy E stroke 16 um, supports the expansion, but it has to have various um, things there in, in place, which I don't think this has. Um, A is that the proposal is justified by a business case, and B, there is a named user for the development. And I, my reading of it, if I've got it right, Madam Chairman, is that those things are not actually in place. And therefore, one could say that it is in reality a speculative development, which isn't what policy E stroke 16 is um, about supporting. So can I have some views from the, the officer regarding um, the, uh, whether this actually um, fits in with, with that particular policy? I know it talks about um, it may be supported by others but I think that you know really um, our our policies are extremely important um, and obviously we don't want to set precedents for other things thank Good. you madam chairman thank you very much councillor Roberts and so um, Alice Roberts as our, our case officer so that's page 35 it's about policy e16 and in particular whether or not um, a and B are fulfilled um, thank you very much um, so they have provided a business case which demonstrates um, 
demand for office space on the site, um, which has um, met that criteria. In terms of named occupiers, um, the site um, at the moment obviously has a lot of different businesses um, on site and there are no restrictions in terms of kind of named occupiers for the existing site. Um, the development is for um, a similar um, amount of office space in terms of the way it is used um, lots of small smaller units for for businesses and so it would um, increase the amount of businesses on site um, a lot. Um, in terms of um, the appropriateness of, of the named occupiers, um, there would be you know, a sizable number of occupiers. Um, so requiring named occupiers would restrict um, flexibility on site. Um, and from my reading of the policy, it's mainly for individual businesses to ensure viability. Um, whereas the proposal is to expand an already thriving business park um, with a sizable number of different businesses on site, um, kind of which demonstrates alongside the business case that the scheme is viable without the need for a named occupier. So I hope that um, kind of gives members um, comfort. So we have a quickly secondary question, that Madam Chairman. Um, Alice, can you tell me, is the, is the rest of the site, because um, you talk about that there are lots of businesses on there, is the rest of the site also, or, or was it, outside of the village envelope when they got permissions? So the site itself is outside of the development framework, yes. Um, it's an established business park and obviously, as I said previously, it's um, somewhat allocated for development um, in the Water Beach, Emerging Water Beach ne uh, neighbourhood plan, the draft plan. And um, it's supportive of um, further development on the site for, for business use. Obviously, the previous application for Blenheim House in, in 2017, you know, that that's um, kind of separate from the merits of the scheme of this case. But as I said, there are there was no um, additional restrictions in terms of named occupiers or on that scheme. No, thank you very much as well for going through those. I think it's really important. Thanks, Rory. Um, yes, Mr Chairman, we have councillors Hawkins, Rippeth and Heather Willis. Yes. Heather Hawkins. Hi, um, thank you, Chair. Um, if I may, again, I, I guess question to the case officer. Um, and then I'll move on to the sort of closing point I wanted to make. Um, Alice, you heard of, you heard about the concerns from the um, parish council representative. Um, with reference specifically to the £10,000 for lighting, I note in the transport response um, that that indeed is slated for a future phase and I just wanted to find out why we are accepting that when in reality we should be looking at having that um, in the very first phase to enable the model shift um, to take place and if I may chair um, as I said um, earlier on we do really need to take that point uh, that's been requested, which is to have, or at least to, you know, find a way of putting that park on the north of Denny End Road. And I must admit, I am surprised um, that that wasn't done as part of the um, considerations <laughs> to the point. I would have thought that would be one of those things that would be uh, top of the agenda. So for me, those are the two things right now, um, two things that I wanted to open up. Um, the application, in my view, is a good one. There's lots of good things in it. And um, it, it's, in some ways, for me, an example of where we need to be heading um, with new builds um, like this. But if I could have those answers, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Alice? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so. The street lighting was um, within 
as, as you've already outlined within the um, County Transport um, Assessment Team's response um, for the latter phase of development, so within aligning with phase two of the development, so the outline consent. Um, we could um, agree it for an earlier stage of development, um, but I'd like to um, kind of refer to Tam Parry, who's also on, on the call, to kind of explain the reasoning for why it was for the latter stage of development. Thank you. Hello, Tam, and thank you very much. Council 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 Transport Director Sahari, thank you. Hello, committee. Good morning. Um, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Thank you. Wonderful. Great. Um, so the, um, the applicant has actually asked if the um, payment could be for the street lighting could be for the second phase. Um, and, and I was happy with that request. Um, I am, of course, happy to, to also ask the applicants when we negotiate for Section 106 that that payment could be brought forward to, to the first phase. So um, I'm very happy to do that. Um, would you like me to answer the other points raised by the Council of Beer Park and the Parish Council as well about the footpath? And... Yes, please. Sure. So the, the footpath on the north side of Denyen Road, I didn't request that because it's actually going to be provided by Urban and Civic as part of their works for the Denyen Road junction with the A10. So they'll be making some changes there, I think, next year. So that, that footpath should be in by the time that this development has its first phase completed. Can, um, we, can, we have so a, can we have a diagram up just so we all know exactly what we're talking about in case anyone fails to see? Um, would you like me to try and share my screen? Yes, you, you've got one. Thank you. Okay. Let me get the drawing first because I don't think I've got it loaded. Just bear with me for a moment. Um, I have to find the right file. So I have it loaded and I'll share the screen. Now, hopefully, oh, oh, I'm not able to share my screen actually. Um, so I don't know how I would manage that. So I can reassure you that there's a footpath on the north side of Denyen Road from the A10 to the site access. Um, the Paris Council are right, there isn't one at the moment, and that is a gap in the provision. Um, and the drawing does clearly show this. This is one that was so approved. Perhaps, perhaps Tam, if, if Alice has got one that we could see, I, don't, I, I thought you had one there, but if Alice has got one, if, otherwise, if not Alice, then we wouldn't may waste any more time on it. But if you do have one, Alice. Um, unfortunately, I don't have one that, that shows that particular route. I have one that shows the, the surrounding routes and, and the proposed new town greenway to the northern site, but not the pedestrian um, footpath along Denny End Road. Um, Alice, I'll email you the drawing I have, and then maybe you are able to share it. So Brilliant, can you. we just sort of understand that what we've got on page 47 and which Council Dr Kimmy Hawkins was picking up on the basis of the Water Beach Parish Council and Council Jane Williams comments is office has asked for delegated authority to investigate with the County Council um, with reference to the Greenway project the appropriateness of securing pathway improvements. Tam, what you're saying they're going to happen anyway so we're just a bit confused here. Yes, so that's correct. Um, Councillor Hailing, um, the, the footpath, I believe, is going to be provided anyway, which is why I haven't asked the applicant to make provision as part of our application. Uh, Alice, can, is, what, why do we have the, the sentence then in, um, in the report about securing delegated authority for that? Okay, sorry. Chair, if I, if I may, um, can I suggest that um, given what Tam said about the footpath and likely being secured through the urban and civic scheme, um, if uh, members are agreeable to that paragraph, if that isn't the case, then um, we can seek to 
secure that through this scheme, uh, it can only delegate that to officers should permission be granted. I think that's why. Um, so we can just we can clarify that um, after the meeting, and if for any reason we're concerned that that isn't, isn't being secured through the Urban Civic Scheme, then we can uh, we can look to secure that through this Section 106 agreement. So, Councillor Wood, do you want to make that proposal? Yeah. As he said. <laughs> Propose what he said. So oh, if we, yes, please. As if we take that to the vote now, which is based on what he said. I've seconded. Yep. Okay. Um, seconded and by affirmation. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much for helping us out there. Yes, yeah, supplementary. Um, whilst we have that, um, just to carry on, the parish council also requested double yellow lines, um, but you seem to be indicating that that is not necessary. Uh, paragraph 53, this parish also requested double yellow lines to be installed along Benny End Road to prevent... Uh, yes, I wasn't aware of that request, but I'm, I, I, didn't, I don't feel it's necessary because the, the applicant has set out a very, very clear transport strategy for the site for, for, for both the first phase and the second phase. Um, and this involves um, provision of car sharing spaces, um, Late arrival, so off peak um, spaces are only available for, for people driving outside of the peak periods. Um, they're providing the minibus service, um, one minibus in phase one and two minibuses um, for phase two, um, as well as the travel planning measures that is a very comprehensive travel plan and the connectivity to Water Beach New Town. So, all of these added together make, make this transport strategy. Actually, one of the most innovative ones I've seen for, for quite a long time um, and, and very comprehensive. Um, so I think the mode shift ambitions of this site are, are achievable. Without the yellow lines. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Other okay. Do we have other? Yes, uh, numerous other speakers. Chair, Councillors Griffith, Heather Williams, Richard Williams, and then Fain, and then Harvey. Some of what I'm going to say is a clarification. Um, this shuttle bus, which I've got in my head, this amazing thing which is going back and forth, and I hope that is the case. It's shuttling. Um, yes, indeed. I just um, can we sort of secure anything more? Um, do a little bit more detail on that. And my second point is the Greenway um, monies um, as part of Section 106. I'm actually in favour of that because that the idea is that the greenway has already been costed and it's you know in the pipeline to be built within the next few years, but it will need maintenance and the numbers of people hopefully using it from this site will you know increase the um, footfall and pedal fall mm -hmm. <laughs> on on the, the surface and that needs to be obviously properly maintained and that all these things just need to join up. And that's the point about the footpath. It would have been just good to know <laughs> and that mm -hmm. was that all part of the picture would be sort of comes together. Good. So if I understand in terms of what we've just heard is that it's one of the better modal shift sort of travel plans that the county has seen. But I think Councillor Rufford is asking um, around the questions that she put to the applicant as well about the flexibility and making sure that it's available for the flexi working hours with that app. Does, does any more detail need to be in yes, can in we there. guess anymore and does it need to be in there or do we just have to, you know, trust that? I don't know how that detail can be ascertained. Would you like to answer that, Cam? Yes, very happy to. Um, one of the things that I've asked for and the applicants agree to and the analysis agree to is, is the um, hold between phases one and phase two and, and for the the applicant to submit a review of how successful phase one has been and if it's not been successful uh, therefore a hold on the development before phase two can proceed so really it's within the applicant's interest to make the minibus as successful as it can be in order that they can progress from phase one to phase two of the development um, and and i think the applicant has every intention of making the minibus successful enterprise and and, and provision for the site Thank you for asking for that. Can we just ask if that is included then within the, the conditions? Yes? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and we have the other speakers. And I'm hearing mainly positive and, and looking at sort of moving us along the committee. So whoever has got 
um, asking to speak, make sure we don't duplicate any issues, and if it's any other things that you feel are necessary for the debate that haven't come forward yet. Thank you. Councillor Lillian. Thank you, Chairman. Um, mainly clarification, but no doubt we'll be and add additional opinion along the way. Um, first of all, I just want to come back to clarify about policy E16, because I've got it in front of me. And B, I'm just going to read out the short sentence. There is a named user for the development who shall be the first occupant. A planning condition will be attached to any permission to this effect. But my, you know, it's difficult to hear everything on the on the virtual. But my understanding for the response to Councillor Roberts is that there is not going to be a named person. So are we acknowledging that this is a departure from that policy on B? Or have we, are we misinterpreting the, the word will? Because if you say it will be done, then surely that's pretty conclusive and it needs to be, we need to have named users. Um, the other, do you want it's me like to go on to my next one? Or? No, okay. go on. Um, the other thing which I can understand is on the parking pressures, because inevitably, you know, there will be modal shift and there won't be so many, but there will always be a need for some to use, to use car. Um, and looking on page 55, the condition, it says the temporary car park hereby permitted shall be removed prior to the development of phase two. Um, so I'd like some clarification around that because that actually worries me because surely you want the next car park in place before you take away, otherwise we could be then pushing people onto the road or other things. So that seems like it might be well-founded and there might be a reasonable argument I, I hope to hear that but it sounds illogical I'd be wanting to keep that until until alternative car parking was um, included and also whether we can word the word the condition the way that means that the car park stays if phase two for whatever reason does not progress because there is there is a risk if it's a temporary car park um, what we want to make sure is it stays in place and isn't isn't subsequently removed. Oh, we're not doing phase two, and we're going to remove it anyway, um, which I think is a bit of a risk as it currently stands. I would also like to, um, as was raised with the applicant, and they seemed agreeable. I think um, we've done it in my ward with ponds that there is fencing, and I think given that this will be open, and I and I welcome that it'll be open to the public that um, I think that's a reasonable safety request that the parish council are asking for and we should condition it. Um, I th there, there may be something else, Chairman, but I think I'll leave it there for now. Good, thank you very much. And um, Chris Clark, I think, is going to answer on the policy question. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, case officer, feel free to come in as well. But um, So my advice to the committee would be that this is, as always, a, a case of a planning balance. And the case officer obviously set out a position with regard to policy S7, uh, and the, the hook there, which allows uh, development outside uh, the village framework where other policies in the plan um, support it. And the case officer set out that policies E9, 13, and 16 do support it. Um, I would agree with you, Councillor Williams, that point B of policy E16, um, on the face of it, does not appear to be met. But I think what would need to weigh is the, the potential harm in your minds from not meeting that one criteria of that policy versus the compliance with the other um, policies in the plan that have been set out. So um, I think the case officer was clear that there is no single named occupier because of the nature of the operation on this site. There's lots of smaller occupiers and to restrict it to a single occupier would restrict the ability of new businesses to enter, enter the site. Um, so I think it's really a question of your judgment as to whether or not you think um, any harm is arising from there not being a named occupier and that degree of conflict with policy E16 um, outweighs the other other benefits and the other policy compliance um, of the scheme. Thank you. On that point, if I could just ask a supplementary question, because the issue here is is the um, policy is very it, you know certain it will be it is a condition policy. Could you, um, for the balance, when we're looking at harm, explain or give reason why? that was included in such a formal way in the, in the local plan, the sort of the, the need for it normally and why, you know, we've obviously considered it necessary to do. Because I, I, I see it as it gives certainty that we're not putting something up which can be empty and, and losing the countryside 
it does feel like a necessary requirement. Through you, Chair. Um, I can't tell you why the wording was drafted in that way when it was originally drafted, but I think it is a matter for you as decision makers to judge, uh, having regard to the fact that this is an existing employment site uh, and there are other policies in the plan that support it. Acknowledging that there is an element of conflict with policy 16, does that outweigh any other benefits you might, might identify from the scheme and any other policy compliance? So, yes, I acknowledge the, the wording of the, the uh, criteria was, was drafted in the terms you've set out, but um, I think that's a matter of judgment for you as decision makers. Thank you. And um, in terms of the car park, could we have both the questions on car park? So I'm understanding in terms of the way it's worded from Councillor Williams, what she's hoping is that what we're not going to do is be left without the car parking space um, prior to the development of a new one, or in the, even indeed if phase two doesn't come ahead, which are key points as well about modal shift and what's happening with car parking. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so with regards to the temporary car park, um, we obviously want to, to retain that um, to serve phase 1A, phase 1B um, in the interim before the car park deck has been developed to help with the uplift with building five. Um, so I think um, we may be able to tweak that wording of that condition um, to ensure that apologies that wasn't done previously. Um, but I think that's um, reasonable to, to change. And it says in, in the um, in the officer's um, report that um, the specific wording of the condition, um, we request it to be delegated to officers so, so we can change that. But um, I'd be happy to change that. Yep, that's brilliant. Um, thank you. If I, if I could suggest that it's rather than prior to the development, um, uh, sort of prior to the availability of the, the new car park, something, you know, when the new car park's operational or something like that and to expand it to say that in the event of phase two not proceeding that the car park is to remain. So if you would make that a proposal Councillor Williams, um, do I take that by affirmation? Yes, seconded and seconded by Councillor Dr Tumi Hawkins and by affirmation members? Thank yep, you. good, thank you very much and also let's use this opportunity as well Councillor Williams to Heather Williams on the attenuation pond, would you like to make that proposal that, again, it's about the wording and the timing of it, as Pam was saying, but that that would be included as well? Uh, yes, I think that, um, that there's a condition that states that the ponds will be fenced. Excellent. Through you, Chair. Um, I think uh, we could incorporate that into the wording of condition 21 around the hardened soft landscaping scheme, that that is um, considered and designed um, through that process. Thank you very much. Um, we have other speakers. We have three chair, Councillor Richard Williams, Councillors Payne and Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm afraid I'm going to pick up this E16 point again um, because it's actually the same thing under E13 as well. Um, paragraph 67 of the report says that policies support um, this development and there are three named E9, E13 and E16. I think we've established it doesn't comply with E16, it doesn't comply with E13 either, because E13 has the same wording. The, there is a named user of the development who shall be the first um, occupant, sorry, and a planning condition will be attached to that effect. So, so it doesn't, to my mind, comply with E13 either. Um, so then I suppose we fall back on just E9. Um, other key point I wanted to make, or question I wanted to ask really, is where the figure for the contributions to the busway, um, the greenway, sorry, came from, um, 133,000 out of the total 165,000 contributions will go to the greenway. Um, that's 80% of the contributions will go to the greenway and not directly to the community. Now, I think we all agree the greenway is a very good thing. I think we all support the greenway, but the greenway is promoted by the BCP, which has a lot of funding behind it. Um, so I do slightly worry that such a large proportion of the um, 106 contributions are being devoted to 
the Greenway, which as I say does have GCP backing, which is just its own funds, um, yet there aren't funds for some of the other things that, that the parish has requested. Um, so my question really is where did this figure come from? Where did these figures Thank for you. contributions to the Greenway come from? Thank you, Ali. So um, just to clarify, um, so Water Beach Parish have also requested contributions for community facilities um, within Water Beach. Um, SC4 and SC6 um, refer to specifically housing developments to um, contribute to the provision of services and facilities. Um, it doesn't mention um, commercial developments or developments of this nature. Um, and so, as far as I can see, um, there is no policy basis to seek contributions for community facilities for this type of development. Um, with regards to where the figure came from for the Greenways project, that would be better, you know, Tam Parry would be better placed to, to answer that query. Thank you. Tam? Hi again. Um, yes, the contribution figure for the Water Beach to Cambridge Greenway was derived from the pro rata amount that was applied to the application and, and consent for the development at, Water, at Cambridge Research Park, just nearby to this site. So I've used the same um, quantum, uh, the same contribution per um, thousand square meters of, of development for this site, which has arrived at this figure. So. Um, the amount that this applicant has been asked to contribute towards strategic transport infrastructure is the same as the, the applicant was asked at for Cambridge Research Park. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, well, thanks for the clarification. If I could just, just come back and make one further point. I, it, it, I mean, one thing they have asked for is, is some double yellow lines, and, and that doesn't really seem very much. Um, you know, the cost of that would be quite small when we're giving so much to the to the Greenway, and it sounds like it doesn't actually mean so can it go, Did you say double yellow lines or street lighting? Double yellow lines, did, just to pick out one of the... Um, but but did we just hear there was a technical reason why not for that one? That was all they asked for. Yes, I know. So I get your point about the, the money, but the app... Yeah, it, it, it just doesn't seem like, you know, that they've okay. asked for all that much, and but we're giving a heck of a lot to the Greenway. Thank you. Um, do we have the next one? Councillor Fain is next, yes. And do we have anybody else after? Uh, we have councillors Harvey and Griffith both come back. Right, so we it's now 11.30. We said we would have a, a break after um, just over an hour, so we've gone beyond the 11.15. So I think given that we've got some other contributions, um, and then what I'd like to know with those contributions, are these new material considerations that we're bringing to that would be significant in terms of our vote? Um, I'd also like us to consider, when we're in the break, that if we were to move, um, I haven't heard anything from moving towards refusal yet, but some concerns, what I'm hearing is that we would have to acknowledge that there is certain departure um, from policy, which we said at the beginning there wasn't. So whatever decision, if it was positive, it would be acknowledging there was departure on those points of E13 and um, 16. So it would be acknowledging that, so we're not doing it. But I'm not saying we determine which way we go, just if that was moving towards approval. And I would like to have a break now. So we have a 15 minute break. It's 11.30, so it's more than an hour's time in the room. Heather Ellis, is it about the break? No, it's about your reference to departure because it's not been advertised as departure. That's what I'm saying. So I'm so saying I would want to bring it back after the break to actually look at what we do around that because it wasn't advertised. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like us to understand what that point is, yeah? Thank you. Um, we'll break 15 minutes.
Thank you and welcome back everybody to the South Cambridge District Council Planning Committee. Um, and we're looking at the Water Beach application in the Innovation Park. And the, the point at which we left off was looking at conflict with certain um, policies um, supporting this proposal. And therefore, I'd like to ask some clarification from Chris Carter our, and from our legal advisor, Richard Cook. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, so uh, acknowledging that there is conflict with policy, um, that does not make it a departure from the local plan. Um, I think there's some clear case law on this point that um, Richard Cook can refer to if, if need to, but we're satisfied that um, it would not be a departure from the local plan. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the, yeah, there was a case that uh, actually last year, uh, it's more, the, I haven't got the exact details of the case, but it's the principle that was established that um, the courts recognise that many development plans have policies that may pull in different directions. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean there's a breach of the development plan as a whole. So it's um, our uh, Corbett against uh, Cornwall County Council last year. Um, so that means that it's basically a matter of planning judgment as ever by the by the decision makers. Thank you. So members, what I would suggest we do around this one, we were looking there at E13 and E16, um, is to say within our judgment in terms of where we're moving in, um, on this proposal is the harm versus the, the benefit, that judgment in terms of any conflict with those policies that are being discussed. Now to Heather Williams. Thank you. It's, it's just on the departure application because I think we all recognise that often there's, there's conflict between policies. Um, but in that case, was it something that was outside the framework? Because I think that's the, that's the thing that would normally say departure and obviously this is outside. So I just want to check that that wasn't sort of a um, policies that say were landscaping things inside a development framework because I feel that's a significant difference. Yeah, as I said, I haven't actually, I haven't actually gone into details of the case. It was, uh, I, I saw the case referred to in some council's advice on a different matter recently. But as I say, establish the principle that there can be departures um, from the, from certain policies without rendering the development plan uh, being breached. So yes, that's, that's the takeaway. My takeaway is understanding the difference between departure and conflict or incompatibility with parts of a policy. Is that what we're understanding? Yeah, I think, sorry, conflict should be, should be the, the word I used, I think. Okay. Thank you. And we have other questions? Yes, Chair. We have speakers in this order, Councillor Fain, Harvey, Rickard, and Heather Williams. Good. And I would then like us to, seeing as we don't have, apart from this issue, which people then have to take the judgment on, um, looking at everything in the round, um, would like us to see if somebody would move to close us for a vote. First row, sorry, again. Councillor Thank you, Chair. Before contributing to the debate, I just wanted to go back to a matter of clarification which I was seeking to raise on the original presentation by our case officer. The key criteria for policies E13 and E16 in particular appear to be, as referred to by the case officer and set out at paragraph 2, um, would support development of high-tech clusters, etc., provided suitability can be demonstrated. I'm just unclear as to the meaning in this context of the word suitability. Um, obviously, plenty of reference to sustainability and so on, but the only reference to suitability I could find was um, in relation to policy E13, and that's set out on page 34, paragraph 70, supports new employment on sites adjoining to or very close to village developments where no suitable buildings or sites are available and so on. Um, I'm just wondering whether there is a legal meaning to the term suitability, assuming that was the correct term to have put in this paragraph in the first place, or whether this is, as certain other matters, just a matter for us as decision makers to apply a subjective judgment. Um, it would help me if we could just clarify the status of that phrase. Richard? For our legal advice? 
sorry, can you, can you, can Councillor just repeat, re repeat that? Yes, my question relates to the, relates to the uh, meaning in this context of the term used on page 24, paragraph 2, which states that policies E13 and E16 would support the development of high-tech clusters, etc., provided suitability can be demonstrated. How much weight should be put on the word suitability, or is this a matter for us to make an uh, a subjective judgment upon? Thank you, Councillor. I think I think it would be suitability in the in the ordinary dictionary definition of the word so it would be for the for the for members to decide what what would be suitable as opposed to the if something was unsuitable okay, if I may come back that that satisfies me it is a subjective judgment for us um, if I may I'd like to then contribute to the debate uh, I am satisfied this is a highly sustainable proposal and indeed has ambitions for further sustainability which obviously we can't have to put limited weight on today. I'm very glad to see the continuation of the policy of access to the local community, which I think is important. Uh, clearly, the, the jobs provided, 725 jobs in the current economic circumstances in a high-tech sector, is something we have to take very seriously. I'm encouraged that if I interpret the words correctly, this is not a departure. It may appear to conflict with certain aspects, but it is not a departure from the local plan, those are the words used by Chris Carter. And in, those, in that situation, I believe that the other concerns that have been raised can be met by conditions, and I would be inclined to be very supportive of this application. Thank you. Next, we have Councillor Harvey Smith. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, well, uh, I really applaud the level of ambition um, reducing carbon emissions, and, and um, uh, as you described very well by Professor French, um, it's only a shuttle bus um, dependent on uh, how frequently that runs and what the level of ridership is. I, I suppose um, my concern would be that um, were that not specified with a fully electric drivetrain, that could really undermine those ambitions and also cause a particular pollution problem within the village and I, I wondered if we're going to sort of talk about the shuttle bus whether it would be I mean I think it would be reasonable to sort of specify that that should be an electric drivetrain bus um, unless it can be shown that it's not viable to do that um, and, and actually evidence from around the country shows that ridership is increased when you provide an electric bus so that would be a, a very good thing. Is that something that you is considered, or would the proposal be better? Chair, through you, um, the specification of the shuttle bus service is a requirement of the Section 106 agreement, the precise terms of which uh, officers have requested be delegated. That's certainly a factor that I think could be included. Um, and uh, you'll see in the table um, at the bottom of page 46, uh, the heads of terms table, it describes the provision of a shuttle bus to and from uh, the site from Waterloo's railway station. Uh, including service specification, etc. I think we could perhaps uh, look to include service and vehicle specification as part of that process, um, but subject to the, the point that you make, Councillor Harvey, around the, the, viable, the commercial viability or the financial viability of delivering such a vehicle. Um, would you like to make that proposal then, in terms of what he said? Yes. <laughs> Can I take that by affirmation? Agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Are you, did you have anything else? I guess that's... Right, thank you very much. Then we have Councillor Ripples, Chair. Um, mainly to say, I think this on balance is an extremely good application and the kind of thing we should be grabbing with both hands. If you look at the design of the buildings and the ambition, as has just been mentioned by the previous speaker, I just want to hop back to, in time, to Councillor Dr. Richard Williams's comments about the Greenway. It is actually a really something in Water Beach that villagers have are waiting for with bated breath. <laughs> it went up the list. Um, it got the go ahead because so many people 
commented and said how much they wanted that as an, an actual connection into Cambridge, which for cyclists at the moment doesn't really exist. It's not a safe one. So that's why I'm fully supportive of that mitigation money for the maintenance of the greenway um, going forward for that. I just want to point out that in your speech, this isn't some add-on. This is actually absolutely crucial. Thank you. And finally, Chair Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, th I think we all acknowledge that there are there are real ambitions and in in this site first first off, and that you know what has been put together in in terms of sustainability and other things, you know, is what we would like to see from developments. But we we have to balance everything, and I'm I'm going to go back to the principle of of development really of it happening rather than you know what it what it is here and. It's when I look at I've I've read policy E9, E13, and E16 in relation to the principle whether we should or shouldn't be developing this piece of land or giving permission for it to be. There, there is something else that also says in E13 on A. It is demonstrated that there are no suitable buildings or sites within a settlement or nearby, or suitable buildings to reuse or replace in the countryside nearby. The, the way that I interpret these policies, and, are, and it is an interpretation, is that we want to maximise what's within the, within the framework before we then start looking outside of it. And we've heard that there is a business case and that officers, you know, we have to take officers' word because we've not got that in our reports. Um, and I think the, the point of the named user, I'm going back to the sort of the purpose of the policy is to ensure that going outside the village framework should be a last resort. And if we're doing that, then we want to know that there is most definitely a need and that it will be used. I understand about the flexibility, but I don't think that personally that that's what E13 and E16 stands for. I understand that there can be conflict between policies, and we see that all the time in the way, that's why we call it the planning balance and weight. And sometimes we give weight one way or another. But for myself, the fact that it's outside the framework, it, it becomes a departure in its first sense. And then we have to decide if there's policy that means it doesn't. It doesn't meet 100% two of the three um, policies that have been listed on, on various grounds. So for myself, it does feel like a departure application. We can still say yes to departure applications. You know, again, that doesn't rule it out, but it hasn't been advertised as such. And I do think there is harm, as we've been asked to demonstrate, in the fact that it is not complying with our policies. Because we fought very hard for our policies and to have a local plan. And I agree with the sentiment that we should be maximising internally. Also, Water Beach is somewhere that is going to have a lot of employment land. Therefore, the need for this expansion and balancing the, the benefits that it would bring and then the harm of it being where it is um, for myself means that I'm inclined to, to go towards refusal and my view is that we should have been treating it as a departure application but I recognise that that's not always everybody else's view. Thank, Thank you. you Chairman. Thank you. No one else Chair, I think we should move to the vote. Would you like to move I that? I would like to move that, yes please. <laughs> um, and so do we have, um, Chris, in terms of those who, if, if this was to be refused, we have reasons for refusal? Um, we've got the points Councillor uh, Williams has highlighted with regard to the, the elements of conflict with policies E13 and um, E16. Uh, 16. 16. Um, I think, I, I mean, I, I, 
you, Chair. I don't know if you have a, a feel for things, but um, yeah, we can explore those points further, and, and I can comment on how those concerns could be further mitigated. If, if no, I think we'll, we'll move to the vote. No, I'm just saying yeah. we've got those noted down. I think Councillor Williams was very articulate in the sort of saying how she understood. Should I just summarise the other things that have been um, agreed through the debate yes, as well? Please. So we've got the variation to condition 19 regarding the temporary car park retention uh, if phase two doesn't come forward. Mm -hmm. um, as well as it remaining until the new car parking provision is delivered. Condition 21, the landscaping um, condition to be adapted to include the details around the fencing around the swales. Uh, the change to the heads of turns regarding the, um, the shuttle bus um, and uh, its method of operation. And then the point about checking the footpath provision and the urban and civic scheme. Uh, and if that isn't being delivered, that's being incorporated into this section 161. And I have one more. <laughs> which is the street light moving, moving up to state phase one rather than phase two. So that's the £10,000 contribution yep. being paid as part of phase one directness. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, all of which were passed as, as motions to that. So taking into consideration, um, those would be the changes to um, the conditions. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. I just feel that there's one thing that's been, been missed on, on my, my reasoning is that, you know, it's a, it's a judgment as to whether it's a departure application or not. And I do feel it is a departure application and therefore we shouldn't be determining that you think it's been advertised as such. That's my interpretation. To you, Chair. Um, I've just been advised by the case officer that it has been ad advertised as a departure, albeit we don't consider it to be a departure, um, but it has been advertised in, in that way. It doesn't say it in the report, but the case officer has confirmed that it was advertised in the Cambridge Independent as such. So we, we, we've just got an issue on our report that that hasn't, there's some confusion around that, so we, we'll help us to, Correct. to not have those confusions. Yeah. I know, it's, it's, not help. it's, not help, it's not helpful, I know, but it, it has, uh, has indeed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're moving um, in terms of the vote here, and the vote being on this one, and I've already oh, asked for this, is on recommendation page 48. That approval, and I would like to say, um, this is approval subject to the conditions as set out below. The final wording and form of which is delegated to the officers in um, court consultation with chair and vice chair. Given that there are quite a few of these, additions. yes, that's correct. Chair. Thank you. If we could include that, and the completion of an S106 agreement in accordance with the heads of terms and in accordance with all of those issues that we've just agreed by motions. Sorry, um, and also in consultation with the parish council, bearing in mind their concerns um, expressed by Councillor. Can I just sort of clarify what I understood within that was the securing the pathway piece of that that we've got written would be in consultation with the parish council, okay. yeah, rather than the, the, all of it. Rather than all of it, yes, yeah. the, the ones that's relevant yeah. today. The securing the pathway. Thank yeah. you. So we're once again. This is now moving to the vote, being moved by Vice Chair and Councillor Henry Batchelor. This is approval subject to the conditions, as we've just said, and the completion of the S106 agreement. Um, final wording and form of which delegated to officers in consultation with Chair and Vice Chair. All of those who are in favour, please, remembering to push the blue person on your um, buttons there. Good, thank you very much. And so the, it's all done now. And so the application has been approved um, with seven votes in favor and three votes against. Um, thank you very much and we'll move. And we were looking forward to seeing, as you were saying, a lot of that was experimental in terms of the sustainability and the standards. And in terms of the typology for business parks going forward, we very, very much would like to know how this proceeds so that it can um, actually inform a typology for excellence and outstanding um, standards for business and science and innovation parks going forward. So thank you. We now move to agenda item 
6, which is file near page 67 in our report pack. This is for application S slash 4252 slash 19 slash FL file near. Um, Cherry Tree Field, Shepherd Road, Falmere, the conversion of cow sheds to a three bedroom house with internal annex and stable building. The applicants, Mr. and Mrs. Fulton. Our key material considerations are principle of development, visual amenity and local character, and sustainability issues. And this has been brought to us um, to allow consideration of Falmere Parish Council comments. And the presenting officer is Richard Fitzjohn. Hello, Richard. Um, and do you have any updates for us? And then followed by a summary of the, the application. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just, just one matter of housekeeping. Um, I'd just like to make members aware um, there's an error on paragraph 21 of the committee report. Um, the error relates to um, the date of the local highway authority consultation response. Um, it was actually received on the 13th of May, 2021. Um, but I've written the 13th of May 2020. Yes, thank you. That did have heads spinning a bit. So thank you very much on that one. Apologies for that. So that, that means that on 21, on page 76 at the bottom, that is the latest comment of Local Highways Authority, um, which means that they are approving the application. Is that right? Yeah. So they have no objection. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Can I just confirm you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, members. Um, agenda item six is an application for full planning permission for the conversion of an existing um, agricultural buildings into a dwelling with an internal annex and for the erection of a stable building. Um, move to the next screen. So the application site is Cherry Tree Field, Shepherd Road, Falmere. Um, the location of the existing agricultural buildings, which are proposed to be converted, is marked with a red dot on this aerial image. The image also shows the built-up area of Shepherd to the northwest, Foxton to the north, and Falmere to the southeast. The application site is located outside of the development framework and within the countryside with the immediate surrounding area predominantly comprising agricultural fields, as you can see on this image here. This image shows the extent of the application site outlined in red, the location of the existing agricultural buildings which are proposed to be converted is shown here. The application site is served by an existing access on the southwest boundary, which adjoins Shepherd Road. You can see the existing access here. This plan shows the proposed residential curtilage um, for the proposed dwelling outlined in green. This aerial image shows the location of the existing agricultural buildings again, so it's zoomed in a bit closer, um, marked with the red dot just here. So it's this big building in the middle of the site. This aerial image shows the locations of the, the nearest public footpath to the site. So in addition to um, the site being visible from Shepherd Road. It's also visible from these um, public footpaths that are shown in bl blue. This image shows the location of the existing access to the site. Um, in the background, you can also see the existing agricultural buildings just here. So this um, shows some photos of the application site and the existing agricultural buildings, um, which are proposed to be converted to a, to a dwelling. This is a plan of the proposed site layout. It shows the access and driveway just along this, this boundary here, um, which leads up to the proposed dwelling 
which is here. Uh, the plan also shows the outline of the proposed stable building, which is the dashed L-shaped line here. Uh, the plan also shows a number of proposed trees. This plan shows the existing and proposed elevations of the proposed dwelling. The proposed dwelling would retain the main form and footprint of the existing agricultural buildings. However, the height of the building would increase by 1.2 to 1.4 metres. Um, it would create a first floor and it would incorporate this curved, curved roof in the middle section of the building here. So the top two images are the existing building. We see this is what those elevations would look like as, as proposed. Oops, sorry. And then existing elevations to these sides what they would look like as proposed as well. This shows the floor plan of the proposed dwelling. You see the internal annex inside that as well. This shows the elevations and the floor plan for the proposed stable building. The current planning application, um, which we're considering today, um, application reference S oblique 4252 oblique 19 oblique FL has been considered by the considered previously by the planning committee on the 11th of November 2020. Um, officers had um, advised members of the planning committee um, at that meeting that a 2018 prior approval application uh, provided a fallback position for the building um, to which the application relates to be converted into two dwellings and that this was a material consideration for members of the planning committee to consider. Uh, members voted eight to two to approve that application, uh, this application. However, um, following the committee's resolution at that meeting, it was brought to the council's attention that the 2018 prior approval application had uh, contained an error. The uh, decision notice was dated the 17th of September 2018. However, condition four of the decision notice required that development to be commenced on May, by May 2016, which is actually two years before the date of the actual decision. So uh, as a result of this error, the decision relating to um, uh, application, the prior approval application reference S oblique 2685 oblique 18 oblique PA is incapable of implementation and could not itself amount to a fallback position. Since this application previously being considered by the planning committee on the 11th of November 2020, a separate prior approval application, reference oblique, uh, reference 20 oblique 05371 oblique PRI 03Q was approved by the local planning authority for the change of use of the agricultural buildings to um, two single-storey dwellings um, under Part 3, Class Q, Schedule 2 of the GPDO, General Committee Development Order. Uh, this slide shows the elevations and floor plans which were granted prior approval under that application. The grant of prior approval provides a fallback position for the existing agricultural building to be converted into two dwellings. In addition, since this application previously been considered by the planning committee, there has been additional and amended information received in respect of the current application as listed within paragraph eight of the committee report. And there's also been additional representations received, which are included also in the committee report. The key planning considerations in the determination of this application are the principle of development, visual amenity and local character and sustainability issues. And officers recommend that members approve the application subject to the conditions set out within the committee report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Richard. So this is deja vu, but as in planning terms, we have to consider this afresh. Thank you, Chair. Chair, sorry to interject at this stage. I'd just like to check uh, with the case officer on this issue of departure, um, seeing as the front page of the officer report says it's not been advertised as a departure application, um, whether or not that is the case. Um, 
Um, let me just double check that. But I believe I believe it. I believe it's another one that has been. Um, Obviously, it's but, a um, side, so we need to check that. Yeah, just bear with me. I'm just trying to find an email as well from, um, we've got an email from Nigel Blaisby as well that um, considered that it wasn't actually a departure um, from the development plan um, because we consider it does comply with, with the policies. Um, but I'm just going to check for the email and for whether we have actually, regardless of that, um, advertised it as a departure. I think I think this obviously needs to be checked properly and whether the sounds needs to be checked with whether it's a departure application or not. I appreciate we've just had a break, but to give officers a bit of time, should we have an adjournment or, or break early for lunch or something? It, it seems a bit unfair to have them. Um, I'm assuming that get it right. it's very easy to check whether something's been advertised as a departure. That's the only reason. I'm, I'll just check. check yeah, it. I think it's, it's also whether it should or shouldn't be is also being raised. It, um, sorry, um, I've, I've just got to it. It has been advertised as a departure, um, but since since then, I did have a discussion with Nigel Blaisby, um, who um, considered that because it was um, we because officers consider that the application complies with policies H seven and S seven of the local plan. That it's not we don't actually consider it is a departure. But can we just establish first of all, it has been advertised as a departure? It has been, yeah. It has been advertised as a departure. Okay, thank you very much. Can I ask when it was advertised and where it was advertised? Because I, as local member, have no knowledge of that. I haven't seen anything in the paperwork, and I'm sure that my parish council um, also isn't aware of that. And we are talking about a development outside the village framework, which was never, which does not comply with the local plan in that it was never advertised um, for a commercial use. Um, as is the requirement in the local plan to be so. Uh, the, the, it was advertised as a departure in the Cambridge Evening News um, on the 14th of April 2021. Okay, thank you very much. We'll take the concerns into the, the, the debate. Thank you very much. Was that the end of your presentation then, Richard? On that? It is, yeah. Good, thank you very much. Um, and we'll now move to um, the public speakers. And we have James Fulton. Are you with us, Mr. Fulton? Hi, good Mr. afternoon. And Mrs. Can Fulton, you, I think. Yes, hello. Nice Sorry, and, and, and Mrs. Fulton. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Mr. <laughs> and Mrs. Fulton. And you know the procedures. Um, so, Richard, if you just take your video off for now, then we'll see full screen the public speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I'm aware of the procedures, yeah. Good. So, um, 
Chris Gart will help me with the timing on that. So you have three minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll begin now. Uh, so good afternoon, chairs, uh, members, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking you for considering our application again. This application was approved last November by eight votes to two, with members agreeing that uh, this environmentally friendly, self-sustainable application met the criteria to approve it as a barn conversion. My wife and I know the local area extremely well, and we are good family friends with the farmers in the neighbouring fields. We fully appreciate that this is a sensitive site, and whilst we have no prior, we, whilst we have the prior approval to build two dwellings, we feel that converting the barns is a, is a sympathetic, sensitive, and sustainable way to create a family home. Quite simply, the only reason why this application is being presented me, sorry, again just, today. Excuse me, just one moment. I, I can't have him not listening to the full debate. Is that okay? No. Sorry, for, in terms of timing, I'm very sorry for that interruption. Can you continue from where you where you just stopped there? Thank you. Um, okay, sure. Um, so, uh, so quite. Quite simply, the only reason why this application is being presented again today is because there was an incorrect date on the original approved Class Q fallback position. This has since been rectified, and as of the 16th of February this year, we now have a fully approved Class Q fallback position permitting us to build two dwellings. We are currently in the final stages of discharging the conditions associated to the approved fallback position and intend to build as soon as they are discharged. We are hoping that as this is an identical application to the one that was approved last November, that the committee members will approve this conversion again today. And instead of building the two dwellings that we already have the permission to build, we are able to convert the barns into one sustainable, eco-friendly family home. To ensure that the conversion is sustainable, all heating will be provided by a ground source heat pump, all rainwater from the roof will be collected and reused, and the solar panels we intend to use will provide a large proportion of the energy required and are laminated into the metal sheeting, so not to affect the aesthetics of the barn conversion. Whilst we are aware that there are multiple examples of an established Class Q fallback in position in case law, which has allowed for new builds in the countryside, we are simply dedicated to converting what is already there. In fact, there was a comment made in the meeting last November about only retaining four of the steel struts from each of the barns. I would just like to clarify that this is not the case and we will be retaining as much as possible of the current barns in order to be sympathetic to the environment. This includes all 22 of the steel uprights that are currently in situ not only altering the shape of one of those struts to allow for a door. We will be retaining all 10 of the roof struts and only altering the height of a couple of those struts to allow for headroom, thus contributing to the fact that this constitutes as a barn conversion which meets policy as recommended by the planning officers today, and which also contributed to the fact that this application has already been approved by the committee once before. If approved today, we intend on planting additional native trees that will provide screening but more importantly, provide additional habitat for wildlife. We've already put up bird boxes, bat boxes, and relocated the owl box in line with the guidance from the Barn Owl Trust, and are maintaining the surrounding hedges to promote bird nesting sites. The plan shows the proposed curtilage round the barns will safeguard the site from future development. And retain maximum land for livestock and irrigation today. We are hopeful as we now have all of the permissions in place with the correct dates and nothing has changed with this application since the committee last approved it that you will allow us to start building our family home. Thank you very much and obviously we have to consider everything afresh. That's that's what the system is. So um, that's what is going to be in front of the members. Do we have any questions um, members? No. Thank you for your time. Um, we'll now thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, do we have Mr. Kratz with us? Philip Kratz. Shame. And he didn't send anything in. Chair, yeah. um, I've just had a, an email from Philip saying he's lost internet connection. I don't know whether it will be possible to uh, dial him in. No, and well, I was just asking whether in, in terms of in case of you know contingency, there was nothing sent in in writing in terms of what No, I did give him the uh, option of doing that. Okay, can I, can I now just ask for um, advice on what happens if we can't hear from the parish council? Well, I mean, I, I, I think it goes ahead. 
um, if, if the parish council, um, I mean, theoretically, they could have turned up in, in person, couldn't they, to, as well, their representative? Um, I don't think it's, but I, I don't think, I was going to say, I don't think it's, it's fatal. I don't think we, we have to defer just because one of the uh, representatives of the parish council doesn't turn up to the audience or can't turn up to the committee. So I'm, I'm asking on the legal considerations. So what you're saying on legal considerations, there isn't anything sort of statutory. Well, I think, I think from time to time, the, the other the other councils that I advise, the, the, the parish council don't always send, they, they object to things, they don't always send a representative. Mm -hmm. I think on this occasion, I mean, we haven't got any, any, any alternative. I, I don't think we can defer the matter or just because of uh, the absence of the, the parish mm -hmm. council. So I'm just asking in terms of political, because we, we take it very, very seriously. And, and so we want to, and obviously when we're in these pandemic conditions, there are often other reasons why people can't come into the room. Um, and so, yes, I can see we have a few requests to speak. Councillors Williams and Roberts would like to speak. I was just going to say that um, it, we have in previous cases where this has happened, given sort of five, ten minutes to enable, and um, I think we need to be consistent. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't like to see us move on. The, we could perhaps reshuffle the agenda, mm -hmm. Chairman, yep. Yep. and come back to this application. Yep. Um, that would seem reasonable. Yep. I think that would yeah, that be... Yeah, that seems a sensible approach. I was just, I was just trying to point no, out fine. that I don't think we could justify not hearing... Hello. You. Saved, saved by. <laughs> Hello. Saved by the old-fashioned telephone. Hello. Oh, yes, wonderful. So yeah. good. It's very good to, to fall back on the telephone. We're very, very pleased to have you with us, Mr. Kratz. That's okay. I'm going to switch off the audio on my computer, which there's a time lag on. So um, it's a, a little. I'm sure there was a, a Monty Python sketch along those lines. So I'm getting rid of that. And uh, apologies, I'm a couple of seconds behind you. But uh, can, can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly clearly. Um, and so can Excellent. I just confirm that you have the authority from the Parish Council to speak on their behalf today? Indeed, I do have the authority of the Parish Council to speak on their behalf today and uh, written confirmation that was forwarded to Mr. Senior. Thank you very much. And you have three minutes now, Mr. Kratz, and then Chris Clark will help you in terms of the timing for that. Uh, thank you. Um, there is a saying that applies not only to planning, that if you're in a hole and you're digging, you should stop digging. And uh, the parish council feels that the district council has got itself into a hole in this uh, uh, regard with this application, as uh, was partly explained by your officer. Um, there's another uh, principle, of course, that all planning applications must be determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Now, material considerations indicating otherwise, which in this case might be the fallback position, isn't the same thing as being compliant with the local plan. In that context, the Parish Council recognised that whilst prior approval has recently been granted uh, for a proposed Class Q committee development scheme on this site, this application for an express planning permission is for a dwelling that significantly exceeds both the floor space and the limitations on that, the increase in size, and the curtilage that could be permitted under a Class Q. The proposed development is not by any stretch of the imagination a conversion of existing barns, but rather a new build within the footprint of those. From the applicant's supporting information, it is clear that all exterior cladding is being replaced, the roof structure is being replaced and raised in height, and then the roof structure is being clad in new material. Only the vertical columns of the portal frames are being retained. The structural report acknowledges that the existing foundations need supplementing, and floor slabs will need installing to replace the existing earth floor. It is also clear that the proposed windows clash with the locations of the portal steel frame columns, which cast doubt on the intention to retain even that element of the existing structure. What is called to mind by all of that is probably triggers broom rather than uh, a genuine conversion of an existing building. The structural information that has been provided is not sufficient to establish that this is a conversion. The Parish Council therefore believe that policy H17 uh, concerning reuse of buildings in the countryside for residential use 
should not be uh, applied in this case. If, however, the committee decide that is the appropriate policy rather than S7, uh, development outside development frameworks, then there are five criteria, A to E, that must be applied. These are addressed in your officer's report, uh, primarily or starting on page 86. Um, the first one concerns uh, employment reuse. The Class Q approval for the buildings um, considered uh, various matters, but this, uh, the failure for uh, the consideration of employment reuse takes this proposal outside of this policy criterion. Criterion B concerns the structural integrity of the building. And whilst the building has a, a Class Q approval, prior approval, this application is materially different to what could ever be allowed under PD and is not seeking to reuse the existing structure in the same manner. The Parish Council do not believe that the application qualifies as a reuse of a building and amounts to a rebuild. And it will be interesting to see what the building regs make of that in due course. The report of the structural engineer, as I've already said, identifies conflicts between the portal frames and the window locations, but despite the time that has elapsed since that was identified, no adjustments have been made to the proposed design to take that into account. Criterion C deals Mr. with the Kratz. enhancement of the buildings and their surroundings. Yep. Sorry, um, your three minutes have up. If you, if you can bring a sort of summary concluding, but there will be the possibility of clarification questions where we can of then course, find yeah. out further. Yeah. yeah. The uh, Parish Council believes the application fails to meet the requirements of policy 817 and therefore could not be permitted on that basis. Um, the case referred to by your officers um, was a rehash of a case often referred to the City of Edinburgh case. And what that says is that there are often policies supporting applications as well as policies um, not supporting them. And it's up to the decision maker to make sense of that. In this case, the Parish Council's view is that there are no policies supporting uh, the application, that the only thing supporting it is the fallback position, a flawed fallback. And therefore, that does take it outside of um, the, the normal consideration in uh, accordance with the development plan. Thank and you. therefore, we think it is a departure. Um, thank I have to and, bring your comments uh, to a that, close there, Mr. Kretz. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, and um, members, do we have any questions? Councillor Roberts. Um, good morning, Mr. Kratz, and I'm pleased to hear you. Um, I'm sure good morning. My, my parish council colleagues who made very clear that you were going to be their representative will uh, be very happy when they um, see the recording, I'm sure. Uh, Mr. Kratz, you, you, you talk about um, uh, the Class Q, and I think maybe for lots of uh, members, Class Q is um, a little bit of a strange thing. There's a lot of new members on the, uh, the committee. And um, you um, indicate that you don't think um, it's compliant with um, a, a Class Q anyway. So could you just clarify um, what Class Q actually is and, and how you feel that this may be in conflict with it? And could you also um, express um, your view as to the, the importance of the policy, um, H17, which... which, which looks to actually um, protecting the countryside from um, speculative development. And given that the parish council's view and your own is that this is very much a new build in the countryside, would you um, say what your view is as to the conflict therein? So and what I would just like to say, Mr. Kratz, so we, we're not going to ask you to explain policy, but what we would like to do, as Councillor Roberts said, is to clarify your, your opinion about the harm that is created by this conflict with policy from the Parish Council's point of view. You don't need to... Yes, of course. I'll, I'll put that in the context of Class Q, and for new members in particular, Class Q is one of the classes under the general permitted development order that allows permitted development to take place without the need for express planning permission. Slightly bizarrely, it does require the prior approval of the uh, local planning authority. That's to sort the wheat from the chaff and make sure that nobody uh, is lifting their leg when proposing these uh, applications. The big question on Class Q, because it requires a prior approval, 
is, in essence, is there a building there that's capable of being converted? Now, that decision has been made by the local planning authority. They've granted the Class Q approval, but any Class Q approval is subject to limitations. One is that the development must take place within the um, built envelope of the existing building. It's not possible to raise it, widen it, or deepen it. It must be within the built envelope. And the second one is that the residential curtilage that goes with it must not exceed the footprint of the building. And that's to minimize the domestic paraphernalia uh, that goes with uh, a dwelling otherwise in the countryside. Now, the harm is a visual harm because um, you expect to see an agricultural building in the countryside. That's where you find them. What you don't necessarily expect to see is um, something that uh, might or might not have been on grand designs or uh, a domestic dwelling house with light pollution and all that domestic paraphernalia. It's uh, a visual impact. And that's why there are policies restricting the development that is possible in the countryside. And what the parish council feel, and I do agree with them, is that this uh, pushes the boundaries uh, in our, making that ask of the decision maker and that it, the result will be harm caused to the um, visual interests of the countryside. And that isn't an academic harm, as your officers have pointed out, as well as uh, being visible from the road, there are footpaths from Thank which uh, this development can be seen. Thank you very much. Um, and Calhetta will move. Did you have a question? question? Oh, no, sorry. I thought you were speaking. Thank you very much. I don't see any other um, requests for questions. Thank you very much for um, and thank you. representing thank you the indeed. Parish Council. Yeah, apologies for the uh, uh, technical problems there at my end, but I have to brutally frank to say I don't think they work. But no. there you go. Thank <laughs> you very much for being in contact with our democratic services and being thank with you. us. Thanks. Thank you. Very important. Um, and now for local ward member, would you like to speak now, Councillor Roberts, or at the end? Um, thank you very much, Madam Chairman, um, and through you. Um, this has been a quite a long and winding road, um, as Mr. Kratz has said, and I do come to it afresh. I've listened to everything over the last few months, either parish or here, and listened to all the different um, explanations, reasoning, uh, wishes, etc. But I do come to it afresh. Um, and this is a fresh application, and uh, we, we must judge it um, on or against its merits. Um, the mistakes, mistakes were made, um, but um, I don't blame any of the officers who are dealing with the case now of those original mistakes. It wasn't theirs. That person has gone. Um, and, uh, you know, things happen. Um, but how yes. Yeah, however... I think we have to look at this now on policy. It has to be on policy. Um, emotions, wishes to uh, have family homes in the countryside, etc., are really, you know, they've always been accepted as nothing to do with um, agreeing or disagreeing on planning applications. It has to be judged on the policies. And the policies are very clear that what we as a local council are doing is we are not looking to start putting uh, domestic premises uh, where there is no need and no uh, call for out into the open countryside. The, the open countryside is, is very special. Um, it is being um, overtaken all over South Cambridgeshire, and it is very important that uh, we actually do stick to the policies in the areas where development isn't expected to happen we must therefore stand those policies up. And the policy is quite clear. Um, and if you read, and I'm sure members have done, if you read the very well thought through, well, in, well informed, detailed representation from the parish council, which I didn't take part in uh, drafting, it was done by the chairman of the parish council and the planning committee chairman, you will see there that they very carefully and consideringly explain why it does not comply with policy of conversion. The title of today is a conversion of a barn. It is not a conversion of these barns. It, as Mr. Kratz has just described, 
there's going to be really nothing left of it. It doesn't even have a floor. It's got a, an earth floor. It's going to be higher. It's going to be bigger. It's got nothing. The doors and everything, you know, there is no converting of this building. No converting. This is simply a new build in the countryside and that is dangerous if we go down that route. We set precedents um, for um, other villages, um, other pieces of our green and pleasant land around South Cambridgeshire to have just this sort of thing. They, there's been absolutely no proof of evidence, really, that this com is compliant. M Mr. Kratz, I mean, Mr. Kratz is, as lots so of us... Councillor well, Roberts, can I just... No. I'm trying to get your yeah. reasons. So one is you're very supportive of what the parish council, as you say so articulately, has put forward. I'm hearing from you in terms of your real concerns are around that for, to apply H17, you don't see any demonstrated... Need in terms no, of I, I, I think as, as Mr. Kratz pointed out, as the parish council has pointed out, even the structural or engineer's report um, indicates that, you know, it's not going to be, um, they're not going to be using what is there now. Um, this is going to be a new house in the countryside. And it doesn't comply. I mean, another thing is that it was never advertised as a, um, for a commercial use. Um, and there are barns that are being put, put up roundabout. So, you know, they might have easily been a commercial use, but that wasn't done. And in fact, is it really an agricultural barn now? Because the previous owner of it did farm there and got an approval. However, he sold that on, and it is no longer, in my opinion, um, actually classified as an agricultural building. It's not being used. These people who have bought it have bought it specifically to try to turn it into a domestic dwelling. And I don't think that uh, the policies are being um, complied with. I think if, if we start going this far off the um, beaten track, Thank you. Um, we will end up with um, real problems. We, we are defying our own policies. Thank you. So for you it is a departure from policy and you don't see that it complies with H17, which is the reuse of buildings for residential, yep. and you don't see it as conversion, but rather a new build. That's what I'm seeing. Yeah, yep. and I don't, I don't think it complies that it's an agricultural building. So, okay. yep. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. We have a question from Martin Khan. Councillor Khan. Yes, no, and I'm now opening for debate. Thank you very much. Sorry, I, I saw a hand from Heather Williams. I didn't know if she wanted to ask a question of a local member or the debate. Thank you very much. So start with Councillor Khan, then Councillor Williams. Councillor Khan. Oh, what have you done now? Um, I, I'd like to comment. Um, basically, uh, the question about this is, is quite clear to me. Uh, I very, greatly sympathise with the concerns of Falmer Parish Council. Uh, the problem lies in the whole business of um, Q, uh, Section Q, uh, Q uh, Permitted Development uh, Developments. It's a very unsatisfactory system. Uh, it allows the development of barns that we would never normally consider being worthwhile converting, and I think this is a good case in which this play, uh, takes place. Uh, uh, and therefore, one would, on principle, not wish to do this. It certainly has lots of conflicts with the... Uh, the local plan. Uh, the, uh, however, I mean, it's a very nice development in the sense that it's very sustainable, a lot of sustainable for, uh, forces, but the location is not one that one would normally allow development. So one, what one is presented with here is a situation where Q permission has been given. So we are presented with a, uh, two, the possibility of two, two dwellings going there. Uh, and it's being replaced by a lar much larger dwelling, a single dwelling. Uh, uh, generally, we try and reduce the number of dwellings in the countryside for various reasons, but in particular sustainability, the more isolated dwellings are much less sustainable in terms of uh, uh, all our energy and climate uh, policies than, uh, than, than very dwellings in settlements. Uh, and this is, this is the case. I can very well understand why the, the, the proposers would like to develop a, a house here, a, a stable development, an important development. And if they were proposing for enterprise, it might be a, 
has different bases on which it does it on its own. It's obviously of personal use. I can understand that. Uh, but in some ways, I would prefer here that what they are proposing is full development. It's a new development. And the only justification is because we're replacing one development with two. Uh, it's a bit of a blackmail it's a, in a sense, but it's a, it's a legal blackmail and it's perfectly legitimate. Um, uh, um, we have to decide whether really the, the key question is whether we want to have one dwelling or two. That's, that's the, the, the basis of the whole thing. Uh, I feel that we probably have to, uh, I would go in favor of the development because of that. I'm unhappy about it. Um, I would much prefer that the legislation behind it and, um, were different uh, and was more, gave you more power to um, restrict uh, redevelopment of the barns to uh, buildings which have value in themselves, um, which this clearly doesn't. Uh, um, so it's with regret that I think that I will probably support this application. Um, but that, that's the situation we are. Until, we, until the permitted development regulations change, I don't see we, um, I, I feel that's the way that we're going to be. Thank you. Uh, next chair, we have Councillor Heather Williams and myself. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and, and you said an element of deja vu, which I think we all, all will um, find with this one. Um, I'm, I'm trying to listen to colleagues and, and officers and all the representation, but I think we do need to be careful that we, that we don't fall in, into a bit of the debate we've just had where it's a question of one or, or two or, you know, it's already got this, it's already got that. This is the application as we see it in front of us, okay? We've heard about that it's got prior queue for the two dwellings, but I think an important part, a uh, point has been made that it should be within the envelope, there shouldn't be increase in height, et cetera, et cetera, um, and the visual harm that that causes. Um, and then we have the, the policy H17 as well. Now, there is nothing such as precedent in planning. We all know that, and we're very well informed and briefed on that. However, we have an obligation to be consistent. And I know in my own ward, um, roof height, for example, has been used repetitively by, by officers, quite rightly at times. Others, you know, in my view, have been a little more um, But should we keep crucial. to this consistency? Yeah. No, there is a valid point in that, Chairman. Yeah. We need to be consistent, yes. especially with these applications, because it's not something we see every day. So I, I'm struggling to see how, when we've, we've relied so heavily on that in the past to refuse, why we're then supporting, supporting this, because there is a significant height increase. And then we also have the change of the, the pitch. So we've got the dome mm -hmm. and the, like a sort of connecting building. Um, so looking at policy H17 itself, because it does say the form, bulk, design, um, materials, et cetera, and the character, that's part of D. Um, also, the, the, the fact that the flooring doesn't seem to be like a, a permanent flooring in there. It does, it, H17B, the buildings and structures sound not makeshift in nature. To me, a, a mud floor is, is makeshift in, it, in its nature. Um, are permanent, substantial. I wouldn't say that substantial. So, so I think we've got. It's not just one or two things. It's obviously the marketing and employment use on there. So we are in in conflict for this this form. When we look at the fallback position, um, you know, that is what it is, and they have permission to do that. I don't think we can question that. In, we're not here to, here for that, but. That doesn't mean that something that we that we then have to vote mm -hmm. for something that we feel is inappropriate yep. and doesn't comply with policy. Yep. So it'd be nice to, for us to get out of that mindset. Um, so for myself, um, it's it's going outside its current envelope, particularly with the height and and the shaping of the roof. Um, it doesn't comply in numerous parts in H17. It's outside the village framework, and therefore, whatever the prior queue, it's a refusal. Yep. Very clear okay. for me. Thank Good. you. Thank you very much. And I think you've made it very, very clear. So we've got the principal development, the visual immunity, and local character that would come in with it, and the conflict with the 
with the policy H17 here. Thank you very much. And we have me. Yeah. Um, just a question of clarity, first of all, just around this class queue, just for, for me, I'm assuming more than anybody else. Um, so the prior approval that was granted in February this year, I just want clarity for officers. What exactly what relationship does that have to the application we're looking at today? And what, if any, weight can we give to that in our decision making today? So I'm still not. That's our fallback. Yeah, so I'm not. So just yeah, just want that clarified, please, for, for myself. Do you, the case officer, or are you okay? I'm happy to do it, Chair. Case case. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, so the class key approval uh, exists. Um, and can allow the conversion of the building into two dwellings. Um, as the chair has pointed out, that uh, provides the applicant with a fallback position, so an alternative position which is material in consideration of this application, um, because the applicant has given a clear indication of their intention to um, implement that consent um, should they be unsuccessful in securing this permission. Um, and as the applicant has been said in their own presentation, they have already sought to uh, discharge the conditions associated with that class Q uh, permission, which uh, in the minds of officers, um, it sets out that clear uh, intention to implement um, if they're unsuccessful today. So it's a material consideration um, and it's for you to consider how much weight you afford to that. Okay, that's clear. Thank you very much. Um, well, on that basis, then, I'm more inclined to judge the application that we have in front of us today on, on the merits of that itself. And I'm, at the moment, I'm tending to agree with previous comments that there are a raft of policies currently that it does not meet for predominantly S7 and H17 for my own, uh, for myself. So, I mean, unless I hear any strong arguments the other way, I'll probably be voting against this today. Thank you. Who do we have next? Fame. Councillor Fame. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, we're considering this application afresh, obviously, but as officers advise us, we. Uh, are asked to give significant weight to the legitimate fallback position provided by Class Q. That is not a matter for us to decide on today. That has been approved. Um, it was very helpful to have what was evidently an expert explanation from the uh, Mr. Cracks for the Parish Council, um, including of Class Q, which I think some of us have come across before. But um, he referred to it as a, a grand designs of building. Um, that may or may not be so. The question, I think, is whether it meets H17, is it a conversion? And there are, of course, as set out a number of places, the five criteria. Are the buildings suitable for employment use? Well, this is a fairly typical building, except that it was designed for a particular purpose in the past, which is not compatible, in my view, with modern uh, agricultural use. Uh, in particular, the roof height would not be sufficient for modern agricultural equipment. Um, are the buildings structurally sound? Well, these are buildings constructed with quite substantial steel uprights. Um, they are not, in my view, makeshift in nature. And this is, I would say, very definitely a permanent and substantial construction. Will the proposed building provide an enhancement to the immediate setting of the buildings? Well, we can all make our own subjective assessment of that. Uh, my own view is that clearly it would. Um, the form, bulk, design, and so on, it's the change of use and adaptation. Um, I think it is clearly, from what was stated, and I have to assume this is correct, all the 22 steel uprights would be retained and slightly extended in some cases, and all 10 of the existing roof struts would be used. Um, I don't think anyone has raised the safe vehicular access site as an issue. So it is quite clear to me that despite the assessments of others, this does meet the terms of H17. And on that basis, um, on its own merits, regardless of the fallback of Class Q, we should be approving this today. Next chair, we have councillors Harvey and Richard Bullion. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I concur with um, Councillor Williams, really. Um, we have to be consistent in the application of policies. I mean, a normal Class Q application, there's a sort of tension between, on the one hand, um, to gain approval, you have to retain the existing structure um, as 
near as you can um, to what you find. Um, and then that creates a tension because you want to make modifications that will make it more compatible with a, uh, this new function as a living space. Um, but I mean, if we were to approve this, surely then um, that would set a new sort of mode for these kind of um, developments where you would, as a first step, always um, disregard um, the um, aspirations uh, for the, the, new, the new use and connect, for example, um, inserting windows, which might be nice as a living space. You would absolutely minimize those in order to get approval under class Q. And then you would go back and but say, well, this I think we can't, you know, the, that's the situation. We'll just have to look at okay. the... Okay, well, so then um, if we look at H17, which in some ways sort of mirrors um, the situation under class Q, um, if you look at B, um, this can be approved if the buildings are structurally sound, but really um, it's kind of a perversion of the reading of that B if you kind of accept that buildings can be... Uh, can go beyond what the existing building is because really B is saying um, this is kind of a mirror of class Q. It's just under a different policy. So I, I would um, be against this. Thank you. That's what, what, what I am hearing is obviously there is concern with what's a bit of a perverse system with permitted development rights at the moment, which is you know, creating this situation. Mm. And we do hope that this doesn't continue. Is it over there? We have councillors Richard Williams and then Tom. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, I, um, yeah, I mean, we, we do keep coming back to this class Q point, and I don't think we can entirely dismiss it because paragraph, does, well, paragraph 17 and 59, sorry, of the report, um, where the officer considers criteria A, does basically come down to class Q um, because I think the case seems to be that the buildings are unsuitable for employment use because they're class Q, um, and therefore they could be converted into two dwellings. So, so I, I, we, we can't really avoid that. that, that Q. I mean, I note in passing, actually, this is still the same application. Um, it's been submitted in 2019. It was withdrawn after the, the problems in November. So it does seem it was held over so that Class Q rights could be put in place, which is, which is um, interesting to note. Um, but um, why I didn't come back to the committee, I don't really know. But sticking to the, the relevant policy today, H17 does say the change of use and adaption of redundant or disused buildings, um, useful residential use will only be, be permitted where. Um, is it the same building, really? Therefore, is, is, is fundamentally you know, a relevant question in H17 as much as it's relevant in, in Class Q? Um, and I think, as some other members have said, the extent of the work that's being carried out, the raising of the height, um, the pillars seem to be still retained, but, but virtually nothing else. Um, I don't really, for my part, see this as the same building. It, it's a different building. It's a rebuilding. Um, and therefore, on that basis, um, I would not regard it as compliant with policy on H17. Thank I you. I'll be voting against. Okay, thank you. Um, and who, who do we have more? Because I would like, I think what I'm hearing is that there's differences within this, and those who are moving towards, thinking towards refusal is be mainly because of the fact that this is not um, reuse or a conversion, this is a new building, and therefore that then comes into conflict with the existing policies, even though they accept the fallback position. Whereas those who are again, who are looking forward to supporting this is because of they're taking into consideration with significant um, material consideration of that fallback position, which in itself, which is sort of, is this more beneficial to have the one building in order to sustain a building than the fallback position, which are the two buildings. Um, all are noting slightly sort of the perverse nature of this class Q coming in again before we get the new application of the application. Who else do we have before I bring it to you, Councillor Roberts, to give a comment as well? Final speakers, Councillor Tom. Um, Is it a new point on that? Yeah, yeah, it's a new point, basically. Uh, there's been a lot of concern saying uh, about this being a conversion. Uh, I think it needs emphasising that this is not a Class Q application. It's not a, um, as people have commented, it's in effect a new building, even though it incorporates parts of the, uh, the old barns. Uh, the reason why one might consider uh, accepting it, and I think accepting it as a new building, is because it prevents the reuse of the two buildings before. In other words, it's reduction to, from one to two. I don't think we should get distracted by the idea about it being a conversion 
uh, I think that's rather irrelevant. The, the, the real argument in favour of it, the only argument that I can see, is that you're reducing the number of buildings that can be built on that site from one to th two to one. Thank you. Thank you. It is ad advertised as a chemical, so please carry on. Chair, if I can just contribute at this point. So just to draw members' attention um, to paragraph 74 on page 88. So the, the, these paragraphs have been included um, because of this, this scenario where, where members to be concerned that it's not a conversion, that it's a new build dwelling. And, and really, I want to highlight the point there that officers are making uh, is that even if you were to consider it a new build dwelling, it's, a, it's the view of officers, at least, that um, it would still be complying with policy having regard to the fallback position. So I accept that the description is for a conversion, um, but if uh, members were minded to agree to defer for it to be re-advertised as a new build, that is an alternative that is open to the committee. Um, if the, con the overriding concern of members is the description rather than necessarily the, uh, the conflict uh, and in the fallback position. Okay, thank you. Chairman, if I may, I, I did also add that it was outside the village framework and that I thought there was visual harm, so I have expanded yep. beyond that yes, if yes. reasonably required. Yeah, thank you very much. And Councillor Roberts, I think to, um, from the end of the debate, yes? Yes, Chairman, I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. I'm going to pick up the to keep it brief. Um, I think members have, have actually picked um, the problem, real problem here, um, in that uh, it doesn't comply with a very important policy. Um, the, the policy is there to protect the countryside. It's to make sure that we don't get um, willy-nilly speculative appli applications getting through. Um, to warrant uh, it um, being acceptable, it would either have to have a, a proper use in the countryside for a farmer or a farm worker or some horticultural or what have you use as somebody who's needing to be there in the countryside. And it has to be compliant with being able to be actually um, adapted. Uh, this is not an adaption. This is not a barn conversion. Um, it's in completely incorrect to have it titled as a barn conversion or a conversion of cow sheds. This is a new build in the countryside, which is not compliant, in fact is extremely non-compliant, with um, a very important policy of this council. Um, I think it's a red herring to um, be thinking too much about one or two. That's not what is in front of us today. That would be up to the applicant to um, consider um, if this was a refusal today. Um, but in fact, the parish council, I don't know whether I particularly agree with it, but the parish council have made the point that if it was two, it at least would give two families a home. Whereas this is one very large um, house with only providing um, accommodation for one family who've got no need to be so there, but just wish to be. So, Chairman, I, I very much hope that that we will actually support our policies. My God, they took some getting through. We had all that time where we didn't have a local to, plan. I just want to come on to this one. Yeah. Let's, let's please make sure that we actually follow our policies for the sake of everybody. Many thanks, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I think... Chris Cardo, um, Mr. Cardo, what he put forward was if anybody wanted to consider proposing a deferral um, or, or you're saying for, for resubmission of this as a new build. That uh, I, was, I was just making the point, Chair, that the option is there um, if members did want to defer the item for it to be re-advertised as uh, a new build, but um, from the sounds of the debate... Exactly. That's what I was just going to say, I don't, I'm not hearing that exactly. I'm not hearing that from the debate, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I'm going to move to the vote, if that's all right. Yes, thank you. I just want to clarify what we're voting on. So we're not voting on that now. We're voting no, no, on no, it exactly. As... I'm just about to say what we're, what we're going to vote on. So this is now on the recommendation in the pack, which is that we approve. Yes, please. Um, reasons for refusal, Mr. Carter, if you would. Yeah, so please. reasons for refusal, the conflict with policies S. 7 and H17 in particular related to the uh, enlargement of the residential curtilage, um, the increase in height uh, and the bulk and form of the building. Uh, 
and the visual home. Thank you. And we are now, um, page 93 is the recommendation on which we're voting, which is planning of commission be approved subject to the conditions that are indicated and the informatives um, from page 93 onwards. Um, so please, members, vote. We're still waiting for one more. Aaron, could you help Councillor Roberts with her voting, please? Um, and that application has not been approved, um, with six against and four for approval. Thank you, members. Um, and thank you for everybody who's given their time. It's ten past one. And so I think we now take a, a break. Um, we have remaining... Two and three. I think the, the next four, four by Halston and four at Tottenham, uh, those are all ones that have come because they are for transparency reasons, aren't they? Um, and with some restrictions as well. And then the rest are tree and hedge preservation borders. So, members, do we take half an hour, max? More? Thank you very much. Um, 30 minutes, so that's 10 past one, so we're back here at 20 to two. Thank you very much, everybody.
Thank you, everybody, and welcome back to South Cam's District Council Planning Committee. Um, we are now moving on to Agenda Item 7. It's on page 99 of the Agenda Reports Pack. Um, this is for application 21 stroke 01390 slash H Bull of 24 Shelford Road, Fullbourne. The proposal is for the demolition of an existing <coughs> rear extension and the construction and the construction of a two-storey side and single-storey rear extension. The applicants, Councillor Mrs. Cohn. Key material considerations, the character and appearance of the area, residential amenity, highway matters, and green belt. It's not a departure um, application. It's been brought to the committee as normal because this is a member of the council, so for transparency purposes. The offer of a recommendation is approval, and the presenting officer is Paul Hunt. Paul, are you with us? I am. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon and welcome. It's your first time to committee, so very nice to see you, Paul. Thank you. Just allow me one second to share my screen. All right. Thank you. So is that visible for you there? It is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, the application is for a householder extension, a two-storey side and single-storey rear extension at 12 24 Shelford Road. And we are recommending approval on the application. Um, the site is located on the northwestern side of Shelford Road, indicated in red here. The row is characterised by a group of semi-detached dwellings. Um, just please note on this map the large area uh, to the south east of the site that is open countryside and that is the green belt boundary on the southern edge of the highway. Um, indicated here in an aerial map. Uh, the site itself has a existing detached garage, single storey rear extension that would be demolished as part of the proposals and a brick front porch. You can note here that there's a variety of materials in the street scene between brick and different coloured cladding. Uh, the site does have existing solar panels. The proposal would retain and relocate those on the extensions. This is the indicative site plan indicating the hipped roof of the two-storey element and a mono pitch roof to the single-storey rear element. Elevational drawing shows the building to retain that hip roof profile, which I noted before is a characteristic of the street scene. That was following an amendment that we received. Uh, the original proposal was for a gable end. We consider the roof height to be dropped down sufficiently to make the extension subservient in accordance with the district design guide FPD. In terms of the single storey rear extension, uh, this is significantly screened from the street scene by its small size and location at the back and would project 1.6 metres beyond the rear elevation, which we consider sufficiently small to avoid any neighbour harm. Here we see the uh, simple floor plan showing the depth and width of the extension. Photographs here indicate the character of the street scene. Again, there is a level of uniformity. However, we can see that there are breaks with different porch extensions. And also there are examples of two storey extensions already permitted further down the street. In terms of neighbour harm, this neighbour does feature a first floor window. As per the report, this window is obscure glazed and serves a bathroom, so I consider it to have minimal amenity value. And there would be over 
four meters between this window and the new extension so i don't consider that it would create additional shadowing that would detract from the amenity of that neighbor um oh i seem to have skipped a slide there apologies Yes, and just a quick photo to show the rear of the house. The neighbour has a window set some way from the boundary, which leads to me believing it won't, that the single storey rear extension won't unduly overshadow or be overbearing. And just to confirm again, that single storey rear element is proposed to be demolished. Um, I have mentioned highway safety and parking in my report because the extension will technically come out onto the driveway. However, the existing uh, layout has a fence adjacent to the house. And the site plan shows that it would retain two parking spaces in accordance with policy TI3. And also the site is adjacent to the green belt, but due to the small scale and location of the extensions, we don't feel that that would conflict with the policy on uh, NH8. And just confirm we are looking to approve and that the only reason the application is before the committee is because it is a member of the council for transparency purposes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, for, and I know that we don't have any um, representations from public speakers. I also note that in your report that the Parish Council recommends support and there have been no representations from neighbours about this. Um, I'd like to move that we go to a vote. Is that okay? Um, and I do note that two members of the committee have already um, uh, stated that they wouldn't take part in, in the vote. Um, so everybody else, or shall we take this by affirmation, committee? By affirmation? Agreed. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. If we can go to agenda item eight, members on page 107. This is for application 21 slash 01024 slash um, outline application, land adjacent to 12 Church Street, Harston. Um, outline planning permission for a two-story self-build dwelling with all matters reserved. The applicant is Mrs. Geraldine Roper, who is from South Cams, District Council, the Housing Department. Um, the recommendation is approval. Key material considerations are principle of development, impact upon the current home appearance of the area, <coughs> impact upon the adjoining green belt, um, impact upon heritage assets, residential amenity, <coughs> highway safety and parking provision, ecology and tree matters and other matters. It's not a departure. Um, being brought to the committee, again, in terms of transparency, because the applicant is South Cam's District Council, um, third party objections have been raised as well, which is why it's come to committee. The, the presenting officer is Charlotte Peach. Charlotte, are you with us? Yes, hello, Chair, I'm here. Hello. Hello there, nice to see you. Um, so could you give us um, any updates in a summary of the application, please, Charlotte? And nice to have you with us. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just um, share my screen. There we go. Can you just confirm that's visible, please? It is now. Thank you. OK, brilliant. OK, yep. So um, my application relates to the um, land adjacent to 12 Church Street, Harston, um, and the application seeks outline planning permission um, for a self-built dwelling up to two storey with all matters reserved. Um, OK, so I'll just start with some updates because I have there have been a few changes. Um, so firstly, I have checked the, the description uh, of development has been changed uh, only slightly, but just to point this out to members. Um, so the description previously was outline planning permission for a two storey self build dwelling with all matters reserved. Um, the description has been changed to outline planning permission for a self build dwelling up to two storey with all matters reserved. Um, and that has been changed so that with any reserve matters application, um, a, a dwelling of two storey or under could come in um, rather than just locking it to two storey only. 
Um, I've also had some additional comments since the report was finished. Um, so firstly, from Harston Parish Council. So the Parish Council raised an objection to the application on design and appearance, um, materials, highway safety issues, overlooking and loss of privacy, and the loss of designated allotment land. Um, so several of these matters have been covered already in my report, including the design and materials, neighbour impact and highway safety. Um, and I just want to remind the committee at this point that the application is outlined. So a lot of these matters will need to be addressed uh, in full at reserved matters stage. Mm -hmm. In terms of the allotment land, um, policy NH11 and NH12 uh, can be used to protect designated land under either a protected village amenity area or as local green space. This site has not been designated um, as protected allotment land uh, in the local plan um, and is not in current use as allotment. Therefore, the development of the site is not considered to conflict with these policies in terms of um, the amenity to the community. Um, also, there was a representation um, received from Ch 12 Church Street, which is the property to the east of the site, um, immediately adjacent to the boundary. Um, they wrote in to reiterate their concerns about the impact, particularly in terms of loss of light to their west facing windows. Um, and particularly, they wanted to point out that they have had some new windows um, permitted recently in an application. Um, the permitted extensions um, would involve the addition of one window, um, which would serve the stairs at first floor level uh, and a patio door at ground floor level on the west elevation. Um, obviously, the full impact would need to be addressed at reserve matters stage. However, the stairs uh, are a non-habitable room and the kitchen is also served uh, by patio doors to the rear. So it's unlikely there would be a significant impact um, that we would object to at this stage. Um, finally, number 53 Church Street, which is a little way from the site, but along the road has also raised some objections, um, including notice to neighbours, height and design, lack of parking space, congestion on Church Street um, and loss of, loss of allotment land. So the concern about the notice to neighbours was regarding the application having an extension of time. Um, the occupier was concerned that a new notice had not been erected following the extension of time. Um, a site notice was erected at the beginning of the application process uh, and an, ex an extension of time does not require any additional notice to be given uh, in the form of a site notice or any neighbour notification letters. Uh, the height and design parking congestions have already been covered uh, in the report um, and I have gone through uh, the allotment land concerns. Okay, so just moving on now. Uh, so this is the site location plan that's been submitted um, on the left. And on the right here, I've just shown um, the site on an aerial photo. Um, so you've got the planning unit in red um, and the, the site in ownership beyond this in blue. Um, the reason it's been divided in this way is because beyond the rear of the red line is the country sign and green belt. So this was a way to for the applicant to keep the development um, contained within the development framework and not impact or not uh, directly impact the countryside and green belt by developing into this land. Um, here I've just put together some photographs to show the site and some surroundings. So if we just start in the bottom left here, uh, this is from Church Street. So looking directly from the front of the site to the rear. Um, with number 12 Church Street to the right, and you can just about see number 16 Church Street uh, to the left there. The second photo uh, here is me where I'm stood in sort of the middle of the site looking towards number 12 Church Street, um, just to show where that sits. Um, in the photo in the top at the middle here, I've moved slightly further back in the site and I'm looking towards the front of the site, which is uh, Church Street. Um, from a, a similar location, I've also um, taken a photo here of number 16. Um, so this is the rear of number 16 uh, looking from the site. Uh, and finally, in the bottom right hand corner here, 
This is um, looking across Church Street. Um, I just thought this was an important part of the context for this application. So with the application, um, there have been some illustrative um, drawings uh, submitted. So this is the block plan and proposed site plan. Um, it does show how a dwelling may be accommodated within the site. Uh, however, this is an outline application. So um, this is only in, for illustrative purposes. Um, this is a, another illustrative um, image and elevation, just to show again how the ha and ha a dwelling here may sit within the site. Uh, so you've got number 16 on the left, and I've attached a photo to show that. Excuse me, and number 12 on the right here. Um, again, I've shown a photo here. This is again some 3D perspective sketches, just to help trying to um, show how the dwelling again would sit in the site, but as I've talked about, they are for illustrative purposes only, um, as this is an outline application with all matters reserved. Key planning considerations are the principle of development, impact on the character and appearance of the area, impact upon the green belt, impact upon heritage assets, um, residential amenity, highway safety and parking provision, ecology, tree matters <clears throat> and other matters. Um, and my recommendation is to approve subject to conditions. Thank you. You, 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 have to, you, have to, you have to ask to go through the, late oh. in the afternoon. Cool. <laughs> That's all right. So um, we don't have any um, other public speakers to come in, so we can go straight to questions and to debate. So yes, Michael. Again, Chairman, can the officer just go back to the, I think it was about two from the end, uh, two from the last that we saw, which was a, a photograph um, of the site, looking at the site, just to give me an idea of that, please, if it's possible. Uh, yep, that's fine. I'll just go back to show my screen. Is this the... No, towards um, the end. I think when you were standing in the on the site. Oh, apologies. Yeah, sure. No, further on. Further on. <laughs> this one. Did you, do you have a question about that? No. Oh, yes, yeah, that's fine. Good. So I think just to remind ourselves, and especially in terms of representations received, most of those are, would be dealt with under reserved matters. So I suppose what we have to make sure is what we're looking at here um, is the, the key material considerations for outline applications. So do I have any? Yeah, Councillor Richard Williams and myself, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just press a bit more on this allotments issue because this, this is new information so I'm trying to sort of get my head around um, having had a quick look at the local plan not all allotments I know are designated in that plan because the allotments that are right behind my house are not identified in the plan um, for my village um, so are we absolutely sure that this is not allotment land and therefore I think that there is an act about allotment land and you can't sell it off without the Secretary of State's permission um, are we absolutely sure that doesn't apply? Because I don't think designation in the local plan is necessarily definitive. Because as I say, I know for a fact there are allotments that are not designated in so, that local so plan. Can we have just a, a clarification of that, that point? So I suppose there's a difference between land being used for an allotment and what is called designated allotment land and what this, the status yes. of this, I think, is, it, is that what you're asking? Yeah. <coughs> Case officer, Charles? Yeah, uh, so currently it's not in use as allotment land, um, and it's not designated. Um, so from our point of view, you know, um, it's not, yeah, it's not currently in use and it's not designated. Um, therefore, I don't, it can't really be protected as allotment land. 
Yep. Just come back. Don't forget. Yeah, can I just just come back? Um, I'm not necessarily arguing because, as I say, this is new information for me, at, and I'm trying to get my head around it as well. But are we, have we looked at the legality of it all? Because there is legislation around allotments. Um, and obviously, I haven't had time to go through it all and check what the definition of an allotment is in law. But there is there are legal rules about that. So can I just have a clarification as to whether we have looked into law? There's the 1922 Act. There's the 1925 Act. I think. Um, have we looked at those? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, Chris, would you like to comment on that? Uh, I, yeah, I don't know if it's been looked into, but if it's not registered as allotment land, then it wouldn't be subject to any requirement to refer to the Secretary of State before being used for internal purposes, as far as I'm aware. But unless Richard wants to add anything to that, please go. No, I think it would be on a, a register held by South Council, District Council if it, were, if it had that um, statutory status. Thanks. Um, um, it was me, but my question's been answered, so Councillor Khan is next. I was just going to comment that uh, I mean, when we're looking at planning permission here, not, not uh, and it's a separate legal matter, we, they could be given planning permission, but then find out they couldn't implement it. And, uh, and that, that's the way I would look at it. I wonder if there's any comments on that. That's, that's true. It's all becoming very legally easy, our planning committee meetings. <laughs> Um, do we have any other comments? As I had a William chair. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think looking at it, um, I think you can fit one dwelling on that site um, in that respect. However, I'm not entirely convinced that it's appropriate for a development. A building on that site. Um, Under which well, on, on material the, considerations would you say throughout them? On the principle of development to the, the character of the area, you could say, or the street scene. I just think it's it's a green space that's, you know, that breaks up that area. Um, so I'm, I'm a little torn because while it, while I do think one would fit, I'm not sure that's you know I th I think that um, it's okay. a slippery slope can okay. get I think we're, we're green space we shouldn't be yeah okay thank you and Councillor Roberts um, yeah I'm disappointed that actually that it's come in as an outline I, I think that it is a sensitive application actually um, and I'm not sure because we've got no details of actually how well it will marry in down there. Um, there's, you know, it, there's some very interesting buildings um, in that area. And it looks to me as, as well, also, it gives you that through look into the green bells. So, um, and I'm also slightly wary, and I'll take on board what Martin said, which is um, if we give it and then there's a legal thing, then we won't be able to do anything. But... I'm just wondering um, if people seem to think it is allotment, whether it's one of those things that um, an old, an old charity um, situation land or even um, church land or something that's in Church Street. Um, so I would have liked to have known a little bit more about uh, why people think it's allotment land, um, and. I'm, I'm wary of actually approving it because I, I don't know what we're getting there. Okay, but in terms, I, I can't really hear material considerations in that. Normally I can, Councillor Roberts, so I, I can hear you. Some, but I think what I would say is that all of those things probably would be addressed in reserved matters. That's what you're basically saying, isn't it? So it's kind of, but I don't, um, do we have anybody? As I, I would. Um. From, from the photographs, it appears to be that it's open land and it's being it's used as public with public access at present, de facto, whether it's a, a legal thing. Um, I do, I am, I, the point about green spaces seems to be a, a legitimate concern that people may have um, because it effectively is a lot of open space, even if it was originally allotment land. Um, and I think we do need to consider that matter. If, if I may, I think 
we're all struggling with the sort of planning region, so I think it, it's going to inevitably we have to be, you know, that vote. But as the application is ourselves, perhaps we could ask the applicant to consider that even if they get permission, whether they really want to do this and put this building in this space as a as a workaround. So, I, and, and I think there's been some sort of just practicality down this. They, they do need to because they made the the application. It is also <clears throat> supporting self-build, which is part of our policy, and self-build in infills and being creative in those. I do take the piece about green space, you know, but in terms of, you know, the policy reasons, <coughs> it's, it's not there nor classed as, as, as green space. So um, I'd like to move to a vote uh, quite quickly on this for the outline planning um, reasons. The one reason I've heard in terms of principle of development would well, actually is impact on character and appearance of the area is what you were given if that would be, is that right? Yeah, Chair, through you, I think there are um, hooks to that effect in policy HQ1 design principles, mm -hmm. uh, which require proposals at Mike Wilson to preserve or enhance the character of the local urban and rural area and respond to its context. Um, and there are also hooks in there in relation to uh, being compatible with its location and appropriate in terms of scale, density, mass. I, I don't think that we can really use here, but I think we need to be clear that we're talking about the principle of a dwelling, and if uh, members are minded to refuse, then we're saying in principle a, a dwelling of any kind up to two storeys uh, would fail to preserve or enhance the character of the rural area. That would be my only suggestion, really. Yeah, okay, I'll move to, to the vote. And um, Councillor Khan, I think in terms of green space, that's something we need to do in policy terms to see what you actually do with these, these kind of things. But right now we don't have that there. So um, members, please, if you would vote. And the, the recommendation is <coughs> to approve um, the recommendation that planning permission be granted subject to the appropriate planning conditions and informative are laid out on page 114 um, to 117 for this outline um, planning application and all other matters where we've heard representations would be at reserved matters. Please vote. Aaron, thank you very much. We have a result there. Yes, um, and that is that this has been approved with seven votes in favour and three votes against. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we now go to agenda item nine on page 119 of our agenda pack. This is for application 21 slash 0662 slash TTHR in Cottenham, land at Setchell Drove and Smithy Fen. And the proposal is to remove... Ah, so the next few applications that we do have committee are about hedgerow and about tree protection orders. Um, and it's a bit sort of a strange, but within our um, protocol, this is something that South Camp District Council has to, to go through and do. But we do have a doubling nature strategy. I just want to say this before we go into all of these. So it is important that each of these do go through somebody to make sure that each of these applications are sound and robust. But usually um, we should have all of the... Um, Know, the relevant justifications for those. So this one is for the removal of five seven meter sections of a hedgerow to facilitate the laying of a new sewer. And the I was going to come back to it, but I think that might be only the one that I can do the one. You don't have to move, it's fine that you're <laughs> not voting. Okay, yeah. And this is by Anglian Water Services. <clears throat> the key material considerations is whether or not the hedgerows qualify as important hedgerows and whether the removal is justified. And the application is brought to committee because all hedgerow regulation matters must come to committee. And the presenting officer is Miriam Hill, our trees officer. Miriam, are you with us? <clears throat> Good afternoon. Hello, Miriam. Can you hear me? Yes. Nice to see you. Welcome to committee. <laughs> Thank you. If I can just share my screen with you. Can I confirm you can see my title slide? We can do, thank you. Thank you. So this is a hedgerow removal notice that's been served on the council. Uh, the applicant has to give us notice 
uh, because they are working on a hedgerow within the countryside area and therefore it is protected under their hedgerow regulations 1997. I'll just give you some information about the location first. So we're in the north side of Cottenham at broadly the Smithy Fen Bridge. And the yellow lines are the roots of some new sewer pipes that need to be laid in this particular location. The green arrows are the points at which the hedgerows need to have the seven metre sections removed from them. So these sections, um, there's three on Smithy Fen and two on Setchell Grove. Um, so just having um, a brief look at the sort of character of the area and uh, the exact locations of uh, where they'll be putting these gaps in the hedgerows. So the most suddenly one is a protected hedgerow. Uh, it has been there for all, so all the locations would qualify as important hedgerows under the hedgerow regulations for varying criteria. So um, the main crux of the issue is whether there is uh, sufficient justification to remove the sections of hedgerow. So just to briefly look at them though, so the most suddenly one is your traditional uh, countryside hedgerow and with sheep grazing behind it. The second most suddenly one uh, you can see at the sort of top of the screen there, top right of the screen, and that's actually already a gap within the hedgerow. So technically they won't be removing any of the hedgerow, but um, gaps within protected hedgerows are still classed as hedgerow under the regulations. Then the three most northerly, Two are um, a more a Cyprus hedgerow, and even though they're not a native hedgerow, technically they still would um, fall under the hedgerow regulations because the location of the hedgerow is um, pre-enclosure act location of hedgerow, so they would still qualify. It's an unusual scenario but technically it would still qualify. And then the most easterly section of hedgerow is a Hawthorne and um, Blum um, traditional countryside hedgerow. Um, I believe that, yeah, that's all my slides I have. Um, the regulations are clear that uh, hedgerow removal should be only for exceptional reasons. The hedgerows are being removed to facilitate a sewer. At these particular points, there is no other method of laying the pipework, such as directional drilling, etc. And therefore, the officers recommend that the notice and the reasoning is reasonable. Um, although the applicant didn't mention this in their notice to the council, they do do replanting once they are finished on site. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any comments or questions, members? Let me through Stuart. So just at the end of all that, they're going to replace them. Is that right? They're going to remove these and then replace them. Is that what I heard, Miriam? That is correct, yes. Um, they were not very specific on their specifications, but they did clarify that um, it sounds like they will replace like for like. Okay, that's do useful need, for my decision making. Do, do we need to condition that? Is there a way of conditioning that in any way or no? <clears throat> I'm afraid not. These are notices on the councils rather than applications. So there's no condition. If we find it unacceptable, we put, we have to issue a hedgerow retention notice. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, members, uh, I suggest we put this to the vote um, and that this, we note then this, this the hedgerow removal. Um, can I take that by affirmation? 
Great. Thank you very much. Um, and I think you're still with us, Miriam, <clears throat> on agenda item 10, which is on page 123. This is the Tree Protection Order 0011 from 1985 in the parish of Eltersley. And the proposal is to revoke a TPO, which is no longer current, in land to the north of Eltersley Wood. And the recommendation is to revoke the TPO. Um, and the application is being brought to committee because it's required to under the scheme, council scheme of delegation. Miriam. Can I just confirm that you can see my title slide? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, so um, TPO 0011 is land to the north of Eltersley Wood. It protected one oak tree in a field. Um, the original order was placed on the tree in 1985, and this is an aerial photograph from 2003. So the tree has been not in this, this situ for more than 20 years. If the tree had only just recently been removed when this aerial photograph was taken, the um, striations of the ploughing would look slightly different because they'd still be going around the stump or it would still be rooked ground from where the stump had been removed. Um, so this is this revoke revoking this order has not come from an application as such. We are undertaking administration of our TPOs and trying to remove or update orders. Um, so as there's no longer any trees there and there is no outstanding enforcement issues or anything like that, we would like to revoke this order. Thank you, Miriam. And, I, and I, I think what we are concerned about is what we don't want to have is a situation where we've heard you know, previously where there's a sort of a perverse situation where people cut something down and then say it's no longer there, so can we seek to revoke the TPO? Um, obviously, you're showing as you're doing this sort of, we're going to receive quite a few of these, and it could look like we're just allowing that to happen. But what you're doing is updating um, and making sure that the records are correct. So in this particular instance, that tree hasn't been there as for your record since 2003 from that Google search stats, right? Yeah. Yeah, so just to confirm, at some point between 1985 and 2003, the tree was removed. Unfortunately, our records aren't accurate enough. Uh, some records were lost due to computer systems and some before computer systems occurred have gone off into the filing ether. So it could have been uh, genuinely removed for any number of reasons yep. and as there's no enforcement case I don't think there's some kind of like nefarious tree removal going on. Thank you I like that one we'll use that one so I'd like to put this to the members that we vote to note and approve that this is revoked. Aff can I take that by affirmation committee? Great, thank you. And we continue then on agenda item 11. Um, this is TPO number 0016 from 1989 in Castle Camps to revoke a TPO which is no longer current in Old Camps Castle High Street, Castle Camps. And the recommendation is to revoke the order. Miriam, do you want to tell us about this one? So again, this is a very similar um, issue where a TPO was served on a tree in 1989. Um, this is the location in Castle Camps. Um, this is the main sorry, junction that most people... We can't see your screen, actually. Oh, bear with me a moment, sorry. Oh. We can now, thank you. Excellent. Okay, so there's the village layout with the... Um, main junction of the village there and this TPO um, was previously in the grounds of um, the new inn at Castle Camps. Um, it protected a weeping ash tree and if I now just show the 2003 aerial photography um, you can see the location was in a side garden and sometime between 1989 and 2003, the tree had to be removed. 
again, there's no outstanding like enforcement issues or um, any records as to why the tree was removed at the time. Okay. So, well, thank so you. we would ask if it could be revoked. Thank you, Mark. That's a recommendation. And, and this is part of an audit, so we're actually being able to be better at knowing what's happening with our trees overall. Is that right, Miriam? That is correct, yes. yes. So, again, I move. Councillor Khan. <coughs> I mean, again, we have the same situation where a tree has been lost at a time we don't know, by somebody we don't know. Uh, so it's very difficult. I, I really want to... Look, if this had happened, say, in the last couple of years and there was complaints about it, we would normally ask for a replanting uh, uh, when a tree is removed. Um, we don't seem to have any policy about what sort of de delay that we would uh, we would take up these matters that might, might be useful. Um, but I wanted to ask, um, you, you say there's no enforcement issues. Do we need to have an enforcement notice to be able to uh, insist on replanting? How would you, how would you, how would you make sure that somebody replanted? Um, are we precluded from requiring uh, um, replanting if we can't identify the person to serve the enforcement notice? So enforcement cases have to be created within three years of the tree work being undertaken. So because these are so old, they couldn't, even if we thought there was some kind of nefarious reason for the tree's removal, we couldn't take it up. If it had happened recently, we do have a very uh, strong enforcement uh, team, and they work with me to create things like tree replacement notices, et cetera. But I'm afraid this is somewhat older and it will, we can't really raise a case from some time between before 2003. So, so the critical issue is three years? Three years is the key period of time, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Miriam. So I move that we take this by affirmation that we revoke. Oh. Sorry, Councillor Williams did indicate as well. Which, it, it, uh, I was only going to make a, a point which suggests that we went to vote really because I would say it's hard to enforce. I mean, Councillor Batch and I are just about alive for this one, but we weren't for the last one. So I think it'd be a bit hard to, hard to trace back. So happy to go to the vote. <laughs> <laughs> There's some <a> revealing. <laughs> Good. So um, move to, by affirmation, to revoke that TPO. Yep. Good. Thank you very much. Agenda item 12 and one page 27. This is in Caxton. This is the same. This is a good news. So this is to serve. So not only are we taking away, we are creating and serving TPOs. And this is on a development conditional, on a development's conditional tree planting in First Farm, St. Peter Street, Caxton. And the recommendation is that a TPO is to be served. Thank you, Miriam. So, just to confirm, can you see my screen? Yes. Forgive me, it just flicked through. So, this relates to a current development site at Furs Farm in St. Peter's Street, Caxton. Um, here is Caxton, and the red arrow points out the site. And then I've just put in a couple of closer um, images so that you can get an idea of the, like the lay of the land and the position of the site um, that's uh, a former farm and now is going to go over to eight dwellings. Um, so this item is to request permission to serve a non-emergency provisional TPO on conditional tree planting. This tree planting has been agreed to under discharge of conditions associated with the erection of the eight dwellings. The boundary trees on the site will be especially important to the setting and were the topic of much discussion during the planning application process. And most parties agreed that they were quite pivotal to the development. Soft landscaping is conditionally protected for the five years after installation, but the order would seek to extend their preservation over the following decades. 
the focus of the order would be on the external boundary trees rather than the internal street scene trees. These are the long-term structural trees, including field maple and hornbeam. A provisional order will be served, and if agreed to, and the interested parties will then have a period of time to give representations or object to the order. The council can then consider these issues and choose to confirm with or without modification or not confirm the order. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. And I'm sure I would speak on behalf of everybody that we're happy once we do have difficult decisions and, and the landscaping is a key part of that and we're wanting to see if we does that then this comes in to be protected. So that's good. Councillor Khan. Uh, I noticed on the plan that it's marked the field to the north, uh, the adjoining field is marked as manorial earthworks and there's indications of earthworks. Uh, is this a protected site? And uh, will the boundary trees uh, threaten the any underground remains that might be there? No, um, it is not a protected site and they won't damage the earthworks. There was already a row of trees and kind of, I think hedgerow is a bit of a grand term for what it was, um, that w was in that location. And so, but it was not of high quality. So they removed some of the uh, material that was perhaps more dangerous or was not fit for purpose. And so this is um, strengthening that boundary and then providing more trees going forward. Thank you, thank you very much. And so again, can you please retake this by affirmation? Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a quick clarification. Um, I noticed Miriam said it was not a, an emergency treatment. No. Um, but I, I mean, what I'm trying to understand is if, it's, if we don't put it on now, isn't there a risk that the trees could then be cut down in the meantime by the time we get to put the TPO on? Is there a risk, I think is my question. In this location and time, no, there isn't, because these trees have not actually yet been planted. So it is possible to issue a conditional TPO on trees which have agreed to be planted, either on development sites or because um, a TPO tree has had to be removed and we condition its replacement. We can then condition the TPO onto the new planting, even though it hasn't been put in the ground. Excellent, you're doing brilliantly here, Miriam. This is fantastic. <laughs> so, um, can we take that by affirmation that we do agree to serve that TPO? Thank you very much. Agenda item 13, um, this is a review of the local list of validation requirements of planning applications um, that we've been receiving some information about through um, the council emails as well. I think we have Sharon Brown. Hello, Sharon, with us. Do you want to yeah, explain this item to us, Sharon? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Hello. This is a procedural item. So all local planning authorities are required to have a local validation list in place to supplement the national validation requirements. The local list sets out the council's requirements in relation to information to be provided with planning applications. The requirements need to be related to local plan policies and adopted guidance and be necessary and reasonable. The local list has been subject to consultation Appendix 1 attached to the report includes the validation list schedule of requirements. Appendix 2 attached to the report summarises the consultation responses and the officer comments on those and whether changes are being proposed. A parallel process has been carried out in respect of the Cambridge City Council local validation list. And this was agreed for adoption by uh, the City Council Planning Committee on the 30th of June. Whilst ideally it would have been preferable to have a single joint validation list combining the South Cams and City Council requirements, it hasn't been possible at this stage. However, 
there's still be opportunity through the planning service review process, which has recently started, to reconsider this and to carry out a further update in due course. So the recommendation is as set out on page 132 of the agenda papers that the local validation list be approved for adoption. Thank you very much. Go straight to Tommy. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I'm just looking at the consultation points. We did consult with parish councils, didn't we, on this as well? I'm sure I've seen it on agendas, but it only lists a few. Is that because we didn't hear anything back from parish councils? I'm sure we're checking not missing something. So that's the first thing. And the second one is a bit of a plea. It might not be possible that if we're looking at changes, it really does help if we've got track changes from the original so we can see what is actually different. Um, so just a couple of minor points. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Thank you, Sharon. So the, um, the consultation that was carried out was generally an open consultation, which is consistent with the way that consultations are carried out on validation lists. So the consultation was published on the council's website and comments invited. Um, parish councils were uh, advised about it informally rather than formally. And um, I think the only mail out that was carried out in respect of the validation list was in relation to planning agents, because obviously the planning agents are uh, the largest group of stakeholders in terms of submitting planning applications. So it was more of a general consultation, an open consultation. So, for example, um, Cambridge Past, Present and Future responded as part of the open consultation process and yes just apologies about the track changes as you can see there was a relatively small number of responses to the um, validation list consultation as a whole um, but again this is consistent having looked at um, the consultations carried out by other planning authorities and looked at their consultation responses again I think given that this is a technical process and more of a procedural process, uh, they tend to attract quite a small number of consultation responses. I think Councillor Williams wants to come back. Thank you. Yeah, it was just, uh, did you just confirm that no parish councils have responded and got involved no, in that's the consultation? That's, Thank, oh, that's what I was clarifying, had to just make sure I hadn't missed it. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you. Another question. I guess it's a statement, just to say I'm glad that we've got this journey out because it's hopefully going to enable um, us to get applications that are better. <laughs> um, and just perhaps you know, we have uh, you know lots of validation issues ongoing, and this is guidance for those who are submitting applications. You know, it's good quality application that can be validated quickly and enable us to actually. Um, Process the application more efficiently. So I do welcome it. Any other comments? Yeah, I've, I've been through it all, and it does seem that you've addressed every single one of the comments. They seem a lot, but it, they're from a few people on many points, but I do see that they've been addressed, every single one of them. So that is very, very good. So, um, committee, I move that um, as per the recommendation, um, that we do approve this for adoption, this revised local validation list. Can I take that by affirmation? Agreed. Thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you. And we now move to agenda item 14, which is the enforcement report. And sadly, we hear that... Yes, Chair, I'll um, give a brief update. Unfortunately, the enforcement officer has taken on well this morning, so he has emailed me with... Um, Three updates, which I'll just quickly run through, related to the items listed in the agenda papers. So on the Crowdo site at Linton, um, a further meeting has been held between the planning officers and the developers to move forward with the matter regarding drainage, and planning enforcement are not currently instructed to take any further action at this stage. On Burwash Manor, a letter under caution has been sent to the owner advising that a prosecution has commenced. And on Whitehall Farm, the planning agent for the owner uh, was contacted and they have stated that an application will be submitted by the 19th of July. Um, so those are the updates that I've been provided with. I'm happy to take it away any questions and refer those back to the enforcement team. Otherwise, if members want to approach directly, I'm sure that's fine too. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you for that, Father William. Um, thank you for including the Michael Farm um, on, on the agenda. And uh, I look forward to seeing the application come in, as officers will be aware that was has been promised quite a few times. So if we can make sure that we're on the ball on the 19th to make sure action comes in this time. Thank you. Councillor Rox. Just a very quick thank you. Um, if it could be passed through to Juliere. Uh, I reported something to Juliere just a couple of days ago uh, that had been confirmed by one of my parish councils up in the hills. And uh, I got an res immediate response from Juliere um, the next well, the next day, literally hours, um, to say that she was on to it, she was going to get something activated immediately. So I think that is superb. Um, and very, very quick, especially in the circumstances that officers are still not working properly here. So um, if it could be passed on, um, I'm grateful, and I'm sure my parish council will be very grateful when I report it to them. Thank, thank you. you, Chairman. William Lott, thank you very much. And we do hope that you get past the test. <laughs> so agenda item 15, appeal. Yeah, just one uh, brief update in relation to uh, hearings. So I think at the last committee, I advised members that there was the hearing at the end of last month in relation to the two appeals at Lambert Mill Lane, Sawston. Mm -hmm. um, that hearing was postponed um, as the applicant had failed to uh, display a site notice on the form. So the planning inspectorate um, had no choice but to delay that. So we're waiting for a rearranged date for that hearing. Um, the reason I raise that one is I know members are interested in um, appeals related to five year supply. Um, and the other one, just to highlight, is the uh, appeal at land at and to the rear of 13 to 32 New Road over, um, where they are following very similar arguments um, to the appeals at Sawston. Um, so, just to bring that to everyone's attention as well, we don't have dates for those hearings yet, though, so keep you informed on that. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? That Father William? Um, just on, on the one that was just mentioned, you said the Abbey, Abbey Group from that 1332, it's got gone down as a non-determination. Given that's going through, will we be sort of giving a view as to what we would have said? Because I, I just recall sometimes we've had applications on committee that have gone through a non-determination, but we still give a, a judgment as to yeah. how we would have voted, if that makes any sense at all. Uh, I'll need to refer back to the case officer to ask uh, whether that's happening in this particular case. It is possible uh, it has happened in the past, so um, I'll take that away and we'll find out for you. And Councillor Khan? Uh, it's a simple uh, matter of, uh, I, I don't know if it's correct, but um, on, on the uh, enforcement notices, uh, we've got three in May and then one in the calendar year to date. Does that mean that the, uh, does the calendar year to date just mean the month before May, or is it just that you transpose the, uh, the figures? Where are you, sorry? Uh, on, on appendix page 185 at the top. You've gone backwards. <laughs> We've gone past enforcement. <laughs> We're on appeals now, Councillor. Sorry, okay. okay. Yep. Notwithstanding, Chair, I'll, I'll ask the question then. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anything else? Councillor Lane? Um, I just wanted to check the um, group set up after the CAS report. Um, I just want to check it's not met recently because it was, I think back in the last meeting, somehow I got left off the distribution list, didn't get invited. So I just want to check it hasn't met rather than I've just no, fallen off the list it again. Is, it was on the parish list to re-establish re itself. Okay. okay, can we make sure I get back on that distribution yeah, list that, if it's the date, because we don't know. I, I haven't had that date. Well, we will make sure that everybody gets the invitation. Yes. Okay. Um, and that is everything for, for today's agenda. Thank you, committee. Thank you, everybody. Um, have a great evening.